every rich guy in a plot is going to Palm Springs for the weekend at 725 right through the middle.
Hello and good evening. Mayor Steve Martin speaking and welcome to the special city council meeting and joint informational workshop with our Passables Planning Commission and Airport Commission. Before we get started this evening, I'd like to read the following. The city has returned to hybrid public meetings pursuant to AB 361, which allows for a deviation from the teleconference rules required by the Ralph M. Brown Act. Residents now have the option to attend the meeting in person or to participate remotely. To participate remotely, residents can live stream the meeting at www.prcity.com forward slash YouTube and call 805-865-7276 to provide public comment via phone. The phone line will open just prior to the start of the meeting and remain open throughout the meeting to ensure the opportunity to comment on each item heard by the council. Written public comments can be submitted via email to cityclerk at prcity.com after the agenda is posted and prior to 12 noon on the day of the council meeting to be posted as an addendum to the agenda. If submitting written comments in advance of the meeting, please note the agenda item by number or name. City Council meetings will be live streamed during the meeting, also available to play later on YouTube by accessing the following link, www.prcity.com forward slash YouTube. With that, I'll call the meeting to order and ask for a roll call of the Council, Commission, and Commission. Council Member Garcia? Here. Council Member Gregory? Here. Council Member Hammond? Here. Council Member Strong? Here. Mayor Martin? Here. Commissioner Christensen? Here. Commissioner Gibson? Here. Commissioner Cova Rubias? Here. Commissioner Jorgensen? I believe she is absent this evening. Commissioner Davis? Here. And Commissioner Neal? Here. Chairperson Kogler? Here. Commissioner Andros? Here. Commissioner Britton? Here. Commissioner Brown? Here. Commissioner Dart? Here. Commissioner Gaspar? Here. Commissioner Gippel? Here. Chairperson Cook? Here. Thank you very much. We would invite you now as you're able to, to rise and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please. With me, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> May we have staff introductions, please? Warren Frace, Community Development Director. Melissa Boyer, City Clerk, joined by Ashley Peterson and Karen Jackson. Uh, good evening, Chris Hewitt, Assistant City Manager. Nice to see many of the commissioners for the first time. Ty Lewis, City Manager. Hi, Brian Cornell, Administrative Services Director. Paul Economic Development Manager. Dave McHugh, IT Manager. Anyone online? Elizabeth Hall, City Attorney. Very good. Thank you very much. A comment about public comment tonight, a little bit different during a special meeting. Public comment is reserved for the items that are actually on the agenda. So there will be public comment opportunities on each one of the items on the agenda tonight, but no general public comment as per usual. We start off our evening's meeting with discussion item number one, which is approval of spaceport letters of intent, Wagner Star Industries and Cal Poly. Mr. Sloan. Thank you, and good evening, Mr. Mayor, uh, council members, and all the commissioners. It is I would, an honor to be able to present uh, in front of all of you this evening, and thank you for being here. There we go. Uh, my name is Paul Sloan. I am the Economic Development Manager, uh, and tonight, as has been indicated, the presentation will be in two parts. I'm going to begin by giving a, a background and overview of the project up to where it is today. I presented to the different groups at different times. So just to have everyone on the same page. And then uh, the second half will be the technical part with our uh, consultants that are here. So the spaceport project at its core is an economic development and diversification project. 
The idea is that our economy is largely based, as we know, significantly on wine and tourism related to wine. So the idea is to make sure we support these, make sure they thrive and survive, but to see about, it's, be, it's a goal and a priority that the city is determined to diversify our economy for economic st stability, but also the fact that in those sectors, they tend to skew toward uh, service level jobs, which do not always match the cost of living here in, in Paso Robles. Uh, an economic study that was conducted by the city last year as part of another project uh, found that 70% of the people that work in Paso Robles don't live in Paso Robles. And a third of those drive over 25 miles to come to work. So the idea would be to see what we could do to try and keep what we have, but maybe advance uh, our economic development through diversification. Now, about a year or so, a little bit longer than that, uh, there's an organization called the Regional Economic Action Coalition, or REACH, which is a regional economic organization on the Central Coast. And along with Cal Poly, they advocated very strongly for the conversion of the Vandenberg Air Force Base to the Vandenberg Space Force Base. And that advocacy uh, was successful in having that conversion by now having the Vandenberg Space Force Base. And what that did was that brought the focus of the space sector back to the West Coast a bit more strongly because it was slipping heavily toward Texas and Florida and other parts of the country. So when that happened, we realized that we have Vandenberg to the south of us, we have Silicon Valley to the north of us, which is a high concentration of space tech companies. We have Cal Poly in our backyard with one of the top aerospace engineering departments on the West Coast, if not in the country. And so the question became for PASO is what if anything, maybe the opportunities for us to potentially participate in this emerging Central Coast space economy. So the response was for us to study the potential to utilize existing infrastructure, things we already have and resources, to create an opportunity to align with the REACH space effort, to create jobs that align with the development of the space sector and the developing tech corridor, and I'll come back to that in just a bit, and with the mayor's specific goal was to optimize our city's potential to participate in regional development plans, specifically in the area of growing global commercial space transportation industry. And it is almost exactly a year ago when Mayor Martin uh, tasked Airport Commissioner Bill Britton and myself to explore this exact um, the possibility and the potentialities for PASO. And one of the first things that we did was we reached out to senior folks uh, at the FAA uh, including Pam Underwood, who is the director of the Office of Commercial Space Transportation, which is the department of the FAA that licenses spaceports. And we were just saying, we're this town on the Central Coast. These are our infrastructure assets. This is what we're looking at. Is this something we should, we could look at? And they said, yes, you can definitely look at it. Doesn't mean it'll be successful, but they were encouraging us to continue to explore that. And they set us on the path to look down to see what might be the potential for Paso Robles to eventually become a spaceport. On the subject of spaceports, there are currently only 13 commercial spaceports in the US. If some of you have seen the presentation before, we often said there were 12, but on December 20th, the FAA <coughs> awarded a spaceport license to Georgia, and they became the 13th. So today there are 13 commercial spaceports in the US, and there's only one uh, in California, which is down in Mojave, and in fact, it's the only one on the entire West Coast. So when you put it in context that we have over 19,000 airports in the US, and given the uh, growing importance of the space sector, you can see how there, with only 13 commercial spaceports, there is room uh, to grow. When you put it in a sort of geopolitical context, this is from the fourth quarter of last year, these are orbital launches by country. And as you can see, after China, Russia was the leading uh, country doing these launches. So given the current situation for the foreseeable future, uh, their services have somewhat been marginalized, if not taken off the table entirely. The demand for launches has grown tremendously, but the supply of launches has shrunk. So, what that means overall is just that the demand will be continued to be focused and continue to grow. What we are not talking about are big rockets blasting off. 
right? This is called a vertical launch. And we always include this in the presentation because this is what people imagine when they think about space, which is normal because that's what space has been since the 60s. Big rockets blasting off. So this is what you'll see at Cape Canaveral or Vandenberg or other places. What we are talking about, our next generation platforms, launch platforms, called space planes. And much like an airplane is designed to fly in the air, a space plane is designed to take off horizontally from a traditional runway, as it's called a horizontal launch, fly up to a low Earth orbit, deploy its payload, and then return back down and land horizontally. The payload that it is launching are what you see on the left in the left picture are called small sats or cube sats. And in the picture here, you see Mayor Martin and Commissioner Britton holding full scale real life cube sats. And this picture is taken down at the CubeSat lab at Cal Poly down in the engineering department. And like perhaps folks in the room here, I'd never heard of a CubeSat before. But what many folks don't know is that CubeSats were actually invented at Cal Poly back in the late mm -hmm. 90s. That became a little bit more well known a few weeks ago when it was announced that the CubeSats were being inducted into the Space Technology Hall of Fame. So here we have literally rock stars of technology in our backyard that most of us don't even know about. So Cal Poly has provided us with an actual CubeSat, which you may have seen on the table at the back of the room here, as a display. That particular CubeSat is, the model is called an ExoCube 2, and it was launched, that design was launched in 2015, and again in 2021, and its mission was to study changes in the atmosphere, and uh, next week it will be going on display uh, in the city library right across the lobby here. So folks can come in and see an actual CubeSat. They don't realize how small they are. And we'll have some information about it. So that's the, the payload that we're talking about. And when we talk about how important CubeSats are, they were originally designed for academic studies because they're less expensive to produce. But today, the vast majority of CubeSats and small sats are launched for commercial purposes. Here in 2021, of all of the satellites that were launched, 94% of them were in the small sat category. And you can see there's many sizes of them. When we talk about the launch in very general terms, they take off, the space plane will take off horizontally, gain altitude, go up to low Earth orbits, release its payload, and then return and land horizontally. And the experience from someone standing at ground level would be a, basically a small jet landing and taking off, taking off and landing. Sorry. There we go. Now, the interest in the space plane model is the fact is compared to the vertical launch, which is largely single use, uh, although they're working to try and reduce that, mostly what they have to do is rebuild the re a rocket every time. With the space plane models, all of which are still in the development stages, but the, the idea is you don't build a new space plane every time. It goes up, it comes back down, but you still have a space plane. You're paying for fuel and the service. So as you can see here, it's noted that your operational costs can go down by as much as 90%. When your thresholds to space, both financially and logistically, are reduced, then you have a rapid expansion of applications of what you can do in space when you have less expensive satellites and you have less expensive access to space. You can advance more. There we go. So what we're working on for past robles. So the first step was to develop a concept, which we did. And then there's a two-step process with the FAA. And the first is you tell them what kind of spaceport you want to be. So that's what we did. We developed the concept. And we went before the airport commission last year and uh, council. And on August 3rd last year, council unanimously authorized to do a pre-application with the FAA to tell them the type of spaceport that we want to be. And they accepted that and they sent back the type of application, full application, then that must be submitted. And that's the process, sort of the third line down where we are now. And we'll go into more detail on that, is the steps involved with the full application to become the type of spaceport using our existing infrastructure of our airport runway that we have now. When I mentioned uh, Tech Corridor, so you see the airport there in the upper right-hand corner. Uh, one of the basic uh, tenets of what, when we started uh, looking into this uh, concept, 
was that we must find something that's complementary to what we already have. We don't want to destroy the wine industry, we don't want to destroy the tourism, and we absolutely want to, to uh, support and uh, preserve the general aviation aspects of our airport. The idea is whatever we can bring in must be complementary to what we already have. So there's the spaceport project, and then a decision was made to do a dual track development, which is the tech corridor, which we've drawn there in a purple line, intentionally made to look like Texas, not really. But uh, the tech corridor, if I can, if the laser works, there we go. And I apologize, not everyone can see the same screen, but it's basically a reverse L that goes like that down to Cuesta in the lower left-hand corner, the Quest of North County campus, who's very interested to work with us on technical training programs for workforce development. And if we move along to the right, we come across Wisteria Lane right there, which we have a project in development. It's a 22-acre campus, uh, seven buildings with over 400,000 square feet under roof of a business park and tech park. You can look at their website. It's pretty great up the eventual new airport road that you can see here with potential for other developments and eventually bookending up here at the boys school the old boys school with the landing project which has two phases the large rectangle to the left is a large fulfillment uh, warehouse kind of structure and then phase two uh, after that would be also a business and a tech park and there are also other folks developers looking at additional land out in that area for potential development for business park and commercial space and industrial space. The idea would be if, in fact, this were something that goes forward and we're successful in, in developing a tech corridor, we have room to grow both in the north and to the east. Now, the spaceport part of it is essentially the transport which takes the payloads, satellites and other things, to space. The tech corridor is literally where the jobs would be, the majority of them, because that's where we bring in the R&D the testing and the manufacturing. And that's where we can try to bring in all the talent as well as the talent that comes right out of Cal Poly that may want to stay in the area. And we can build those higher paying head of household jobs, which is what we're looking to do. One of the things, one of the challenges of building a tech quarter is knowing which businesses to go after. Because like any industry, it has its own uh, universe. So we enlisted the assistance of the DX Hub down at Cal Poly, which is a challenge-based think tank. And uh, with the students uh, and the faculty advisors, we tasked them along with the uh, aerospace engineers to research what are the types of businesses that exist in there. You have all from the chassis, the programmers, the cybers, the sensors. There's a whole universe that goes into creating the things that the space planes take up to space. So that's, we have these ongoing conversations with them, such that if this is that something that we go forward with, these would be the types of businesses we would look to have come to the area to create and attract the higher paying jobs. And no matter what type of tech, and when we're talking about diversification, we're talking, it could be ag, ag tech, med tech, in this particular instance, we're talking space tech, but any kind of tech is going to need broadband. That's a given. And we, just a quick note about the Paso Fiber Connect project. A little known fact is that over the last five or six years, whenever the city's been doing road work, they have been laying conduit under the streets and the roads with nothing in it, but it, uh, planning for the eventuality of one day having the funding or the financial partner to pull the fiber through it, which is actually quite visionary on the part of city leadership. Well, last year, the city was, was successful in, gain, in winning, being awarded a $2.8 million uh, grant from the Economic Development Administration, the EDA, for pulling fiber. And Dave McHugh is the point person that, the city's IT. And in phase one of that, it will be, you see the red lines, and part of phase one of pulling that through is going to be Wisteria Lane right there, which is right smack dab in the middle of the proposed tech corridor. So there's a lot of convergence of things that have been the groundwork that's been being laid for years is now aligning. Uh, up to the airport, there is fiber there now. We would never want to say that there isn't. And <clears throat> one of the early steps we did, along with the mayor, uh, Dave McHugh, and Commissioner Britton, we met with all the various broadband providers to say, this is what we're looking at. What can you do? 
what situation could we be in a year or two years from now? If we're going to try and attract that level of technology companies, what can we provide? And they've all come back with what they can propose. I uh, recently had a very interesting meeting with uh, AT&T about their 5G hub opportunities that they develop for innovation campuses. They have a very interesting model that they do specifically for tech centers at a number of universities. And they would be very, very eager to work with us on that out in our tech corridor, perhaps with Cuesta, perhaps with Cal Poly, perhaps with another entity. But the models exist, the technology exists. And so if this is something we decide to move forward with, um, there are plans that can be put into play. Overall, the benefits for what we're talking about here, economic development, the combination of the tech corridor and the spaceport is to create jobs. You can reach out to Silicon Valley, which is literally just up the road. We have educational training programs with Cuesta, Cal Poly, but also we'd want to work with the local schools, uh, reaching out to the STEM kids, the industrial arts programs. Um, we want to be able to have, when you talk about a talent pipeline, we have the potential to create depth. So kids that are at a lower in, in, in high school can see there's a place I can go with the things that interest me. And so they, there's an actual pipeline to, uh, to great jobs here locally. Gives us a chance on all of the grants and opportunities for uh, bringing in money with Cal Poly and Cuesta, but as well working with our state and federal political um, supporters, our leaders in Sacramento, as well as in Washington. And then of course working to develop um, what may be a tech ecosystem out in the northeast part of uh, the Paso. In the last, uh, about a month and a half ago, I did a very brief sort of presentation, and I briefly mentioned um, space planes, and so I wanted to elaborate on that a bit. These are some actual space plane companies. Uh, there are several dozen space plane companies um, working on developing their prototypes. Uh, this one here is based in the UK. This one over in the lower right is in, based in New Zealand and the Netherlands. Up here uh, in the upper right-hand corner is based up in Alberta, Canada. And then there's a number of them here in the US, including Wagner Star Industries, uh, the CEO of which, Glenn Wagner, is on the phone. It's based in Florida. They're on the line tonight with us, along with some members of his team, if counselor or commissioners have questions for them uh, in the presentation. Now, a little bit about how the, uh, where we are in the development. These are all sort of next generation in development. This is Don Aerospace, based in New Zealand, and their prototype began flying last August. You can go on, on their website. They've got lots of great pictures of their craft. Uh, and videos and things like that. And the question came up is, how big are these? What size are they? So to give you context, their prototype is 16 feet long and fully loaded with fuel and cargo weighs 600 pounds. So two guys can push it around on a dolly. That's a space plane right there. And this is something that's been flying since last August. Now their plans, this is their proof of concept. And this is what they have here currently. And their plan, their commercial model, which you see there, is the larger version. And when you look at the specs, it is almost identical in weight and length to a Gulfstream G280, which is a mid-sized uh, private jet like we see pretty much every day out of the airport now. So that's today and the ambitious future for um, commercial space plane business models. This is a company, Space Engine Systems, based up in Alberta, Canada. Uh, and with their prototypes. This is sort of their development timeline. Last year, they had their engine technology demonstrator that worked. Their goal is to have their first flying prototype here, flying by the end of 2023, with a commercial vehicle by 2025. Their uh, model is based on point to point. Uh, if they're looking to maybe, they're going to have multiple spaceport bases here in the U.S. They've already incorporated uh, a U.S. subsidiary in Delaware, and they have already signed an MOU in Florida, and I know they visited the spaceport, uh, spaceport in Texas, and they're certainly interested in looking at the West Coast as well. So most of these companies will be looking to have multiple footprints, and that's something that we offer is a West Coast-specific footprint. And as you can see here, horizontal takeoff and landing, 100% reusable, etc. And of course, Wagner Star Industries, again, who's on the line with us this evening, and they have submitted a letter of intent, which was in your packets. Uh, and also in there, uh, Wagner um, Star Industries provided a pretty comprehensive overview of their operations, which I haven't included in the PowerPoint. It is quite detailed, um, but it really shows how their operation would run, what a spaceport operation would look like, et cetera. And as I said, uh, when we come to the questions, if any of you have any 
Questions from Mr. Wagner and his team? They're on the call. Now, um, I wanted to just go through all of the different people that have been involved in this process. I said we're coming up on almost a year since we started it. And uh, one of the steps was this was under the leadership of uh, City Manager Lewis, we created last year a weekly spaceport working group with Mayor Martin, Councilman Hammond, City Manager Lewis, Assistant City Manager Kuat when he joined the team, uh, Director of Public Works, Christopher Leckel, Airport Manager Roger Oxborough, and myself. And we met pretty much weekly on Wednesdays uh, to discuss where we were, and there was just pretty much almost something all, every week to talk about, uh, just to see where are we going and sort of are we on the right path and keep the conversation uh, moving forward. Additionally to that, the mayor organized, had set up a technical advisory group, or TAG, and on the left here, you see some of the folks that were involved with it. It's, it was an aggregation of people with exceptional experience in technology and other areas. And you also see we also included in this working group the leadership from Travel Paso, which is our tourism marketing office, as well as the leadership of the Chamber of Commerce. And that is very intentional because we wanted to have technology people, but also from a holistic approach for the community, people that have an eye on our tourism as well as our local business community to make sure what we're doing is complementary and consistent with our overall economic development. Uh, I'd like to call out a couple members of the TAG. It was organized uh, by Bill Britton, whose day job is as the Vice President and CIO of Cal Poly. He's also the Director of the California Cyber Institute. He's the recipient of the Tambaline Technology Leadership Award from 2021, and he's also a Lieutenant Colonel, a retired from the United States Air Force, and he's here this evening in his capacity as an airport commissioner. Also a special advisor, and one of the first people we reached out to this process, uh, is Dr. George Neld, uh, who's been in the field, a leader in the field for a very long time. He has a PhD in aeronautics and astronautics from Stanford University. He worked on the space shuttle program at NASA. He was an assistant professor at the United States Air Force Academy. He was, from 2008 to 2018, the associate administrator for the Commercial Space Transportation Office at the FAA. And he currently serves as the chairman of the Global Spaceport Alliance. And two days from now, on Thursday, he's going to space as part of the flight crew on Blue Origin. They're supposed to go today, but it got bumped because of weather. And so, uh, but on Thursday, he's going to become an official astronaut. Now, these are some folks we work with, but also here meeting with tonight are technical experts. Uh, this was, and we're going to be reviewing the um, preliminary technical review, which was conducted. And just to tell you a little bit about the folks we're working with, Tartaglia Engineering, uh, they've been providing airport engineering services, for over, including to Paso Robles, for over 38 years. They have an in-depth knowledge of FAA guidelines and a very deep familiarity with Paso Robles uh, because they've been working here at our airport for a long time. So. Perfect people to have, not a learning curve. They already know where all the pipes and wires are. So that is an excellent uh, resource to have. And they partnered with Mr. Stu Witt from Whitman Associates. Uh, a little bit about his background, graduate of the Top Gun Naval Fighter School. He flew F-4 Tomcats off of aircraft carriers. He was a project pilot with F-18s from the Naval Warfare Center. He was an engineering test pilot with B-1 bombers, F-16s, and F-23s. The really exciting part about his career was from 2002 to 2016, he was the general manager and CEO of the Mojave Air and Spaceport, which is the only other one in California and on the West Coast. And in 2004, Mojave, under the leadership of Mr. Witt, was designated the nation's first inland spaceport. And he currently serves as well as the chairman emeritus of the Commercial Space Flight Federation. And one Fine, this will ramble before I relinquish the clicker. Uh, last year, when the actor uh, William Shatner, Captain Kirk from Star Trek, went to space on Blue Origins, when he came back down, uh, the local news interviewed Mr. Witt because of his pioneering role in commercial space transportation. Great interview, you can, you can see it online. And they asked him, what were your thoughts when you saw this rocket go up and these people come back down. What went through your mind? And he says, what I thought about were all the people and all the years that went into engineering the millions of miracles that made this look easy. So when we talk about our tech corridor, that's what we're talking about, is bringing all of those people, those engineers, designers, technicians that work on making those miracles that make space look easy. Now, with that, 
we move to the subject of the, this particular part, which is the letters of intent. We have two letters of intent which are in your kits. Uh, one is from Wagner Star Industries. They've expressed interest uh, in a space freight cargo operation at the proposed passable spaceport. And as you can see there, the relationship represents for them uh, the opportunity to use their horizontal takeoff and horizontal landing space plane for flight opportunities. We also have a letter of intent, and again, this is not like a letter of support. These are people that intend to do something. Uh, from Cal Poly, uh, they've expressed interest in providing educational opportunities at the proposed Bashable Spaceport, and the potential relationship presents Cal Poly Learn by Doing, which is their motto, opportunities in aeronautics and space to support its educational mission. From the city side, Experts in the, the application process tell us that relationships with potential launch partners, as well as with institutions of higher learning, are beneficial to have in support of an FAA spaceport license application. And with that, I would be happy to try to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. So what I'd like to do here is, is invite questions on Paul's presentation, and then Paul Wagner Star is online, and perhaps they would like to make a statement or, or entertain some questions for us also. So questions for Mr. Sloan? You're obviously an excellent instructor. Um, thank you, very well done. thank you, Paul. And thank I, you. I neglected to mention, for those of you unfamiliar, Paul Sloan is the city's economic development manager. So thank you. Uh, Wagner Star Industries online. Anybody listening in right now like to make a comment? Yes, Glenn Wagner or Wagner Star Industries. I would like to point out the opportunities that can arise from passive roadways. What it already had, what the city already has going for it on the tourism end is actually beneficial for the creation of a spaceport. Adding in Cal Poly as a joint interest for potentially being a microgravity customer that we would provide services for. Um, would be beneficial to the city and everyone as a whole in the region because, as you know from the recent uh, TVAC to Terra Normal to the SPOC scale, that came from your specific region. And being able to certify experimental payloads and experiments in a timely manner and not have to wait a long time is extremely beneficial for academia at Cal Poly and in the region because they can actually start commercializing their tech and the people will not have to worry about trying to go get more funding because, you know, Bill Britton can chime in on this specific note as well and interrupt me on it, is that, you know, you have people, they have money, they go through the whole research and then their time to launch, you know, they don't have more funding, so they have to stop. And I think this is a very dual beneficial relationship for us in the city of Paso Robles. And as a potential user for the site, uh, we can provide insight as well as like additional what we need and how that can go around with FAA requirements. And I also have Marshall Hurd on the call who's very familiar with those. And we're both available for questions in regards to this. Thank you very much for being online tonight. Are there any questions from the representatives of Wagner Star Industries? Very good. In that case, we, um, I do have a couple of questions. Paul, if you can come back to the microphone. I just want to clarify a couple of things before we, we move on. Yes, sir. Um, you, you had talked about uh, letters of interest. Uh, as, as, we, as we move forward, what is the role and value of letters of interest from commercial space industry representatives? Letters of intent or letters intent. of intent? I'm sorry, intent. So a letter of intent, it's, and the letter of intent temp that we're using was written by our city attorney, BBK, and it is their non-binding and they're not exclusive, but they are intended to express um, the intent to have a working relationship. So if in fact the city decides that they want to move forward with the spaceport opportunity, these are entities that have expressed an, an, an intent to want to go along and be part of that with us, be it Cal Poly or Wagner Star Industries. And we do have a couple of letters of support. I think the first letter of support came from our very own Chamber of Commerce. Correct. And I believe we also have a letter of support from the REACH organization. Absolutely. I've also had conversations with uh, the, the leadership at Cuesta, and they're very interested in this. Uh, I've had conversations with the mayor of Atascadero. They're very interested in moving ahead with us on developing a North County broadband strategy to drive the data necessary to qualify for federal funding. They, they also recognize uh, the uh, value to the entire region of such a development, not just for Pass or Robles. I've uh, been in contact with the offices of Congressman Panetta and Carbajal. They've been very encouraging, and I've spoken with our state uh, uh, 
uh, Representative John Laird. So we're trying to reach out and build, uh, you know, as large a base of interest and support as we can so that people realize that this isn't just Pastor Robles talking. This is something that when we talk about the concept of regional economic development, this actually is the definition of regional economic development. So, thank you. With that, I will open it for public comment. Anyone who would like to speak, we invite you to fill out a speaker identification card if you're in the room and come to the lectern. Give us your name so people know who's speaking. If you are online and would like to comment, uh, there is a phone number for you to call, and we invite you to do that. With that, I'll open public comment and welcome Mr. Gustin. Good evening. I'm uh, really pleased with the presentation tonight. I've been involved in the airport many different ways since 1979 when I came, represented the only long-term flights or um, airlines, scheduled airline that we had at Paso Robles. And I also was very fortunate to watch the very first space shuttle take off down in Florida. <clears throat> uh, there's no doubt that uh, space is the future of our world as whole. We got too many satellites up there, but nevertheless, uh, this, these unmanned uh, vehicles are the answer because they can be returned to Earth just as the space shuttle did. And that's very economical to do it that way. Uh, I'm also glad that you got Bill Brighton on the airport commission as well as Paul Sloan coordinating this. I highly recommend that they stay with this project all the way through. Thank you, sir. Is there anyone else in the room who would like to speak? Welcome. Michael Rivera, PO Box 3134. Um, members of the uh, sitting boards, council, public, uh, I want to lend my full support with only one caveat. The, the support of this is, is, is important. As uh, the chairman of the private industry council in Santa Barbara County in the 90s, we funded an organization that was led by Andreas Eastrand and culminated in the designation for Vandenberg as a commercial space flight center. And so I understand the, the relevant implications of having this in our community. Uh, we worked very hard at the time when we funded it. The uh, commercial space flight individuals who were involved, Jim DeAnne, Ray Deutsch, who has passed since, and others, were very involved in trying to get this off the ground and found that they were short of money to continue to move forward. Somebody may have remembered those times. Andrea put a group together that basically created uh, the spaceport. And you see some of the results of that even today. So it can be a great thing to do. However, the devil's in the details, as we all know. When you move forward on something this significant, there are a lot of things moving parts. And so you have to make sure that the public understands that there are a lot of things going on here that uh, will result in positive impacts, both economic development-wise and various other ways. So I wholly support this effort. I think that it could be a very good thing for the people of the city of Paso Robles and the region. Uh, upward mobility for our people uh, and giving them an opportunity to see great things as we move forward. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Is there anyone else in the room who would like to speak? Is there anyone online who would like to speak? No, sir. Very good. We're going to close public comment, bring it back to the joint uh, commissions here for uh, conversation and discussion. The action before the council tonight is to authorize the mayor to sign the attached non-binding letters of intent and then also the authority to sign future uh, non-binding spaceport-related LOIs. So with that, I'll open it up for conversation. Who would like to speak? We're not that shy. Yes, sir. Uh, this is Commissioner Christensen. Um, Mr. Sloan, I had a question, and maybe I might have misunderstood. Could you just elaborate again on the time frame that we're looking at for the application process? I know it's a little bit in this packet, but maybe just to uh, kind of reiterate some of that information. 
there's not a specific requirement. It, it's just basically as we go through the steps. And um, there is in the uh, preliminary technical review document that Tartaglia and Witt, uh, Mr. Witt will be uh, presenting, there's a Gantt chart which shows uh, a schedule, a preliminary schedule of 28 months, um, that if this is something we decide to go forward, and there are many, many steps in there, uh, as you can see, it would be with the target of having a spaceport license potentially delivered by June of 2024. Great, thank you. I appreciate that. I, I did see the chart, but just you correlating that really helps me get a picture. Thank you. Mr. Hammond. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, personally, what I'd like to hear from maybe is um, John Smith from Tartaglia, give a little overview of his report, then maybe from Stu Witt as regarding um, directly from his mouth of what he has done over in the uh, Mojave area to make this happen. Actually, John, I think that's more relevant to the second item on the agenda. Oh, this okay. is just letters of intent. This unless is, okay. unless this you've is, got something. All right, okay. there you go. I'll stay. Okay. Any other comment on the letters of intent? Mr. Britton. He defers right. to, okay, Mr. Britton. Um, so, I think just a really important Mr. Britton, you need, your, your microphone is not on. Needs to, needs to look green. There you go. I'm green. Thank you. There's a couple of things that are really important from the Cal Poly perspective I'd like to represent very quickly. First of all, for those of you who don't realize, and uh, we didn't really say here, but we have students who build these small sets as projects at the university. And they actually then wait for our, what's called a ride into space and all of those rides. They've actually sent some of their platforms to Russia to launch. They've done it from the Cape. They've done it from Alaska. They've done it from wherever there is. Sometimes, because of the importance of that vehicle's mission, that is the launch vehicle, the student's project gets bumped. And they've waited up to five to seven years to see a platform that they build launch. What this could do is it could allow them to build it and launch it in the same year that that student is in the program and see the benefit of that. That ability to deliver that platform in that time frame also then increases the opportunity to write requests for research federal dollars for students to learn on, to, to be able to build new systems, do new things for the government, and enhance the learn by doing for Cal Poly. So the letter of intent from Cal Poly says, my gosh, why wouldn't we want to be involved in that? Because this is something that really is success for our students, the access to space on that kind of level. And I think the other thing that's interesting here that, that Again, the, the combination of the city, um, the newness of the project. Um, commercial space and commercial space launch is really a new evolving ecosystem. In that context, that means that there are things that they do about that they haven't designed yet. And so what that affords us as a city is the opportunity to help define what that ecosystem looks like. So the idea of the economic development quarter is exactly that. It's that maker space to be able to design, build, and then provide the workforce for that ecosystem to develop and flourish. And we've seen what it's done in Florida and other places for the vertical launch systems. Lastly, what I'd like to just discuss real quick is something that we have to take advantage of, that every builder of a platform, every company in the tech business says the same question. Where does the workforce come from? And now what Cal Poly says is, why does our workforce leave? They all have to leave. The jobs are not there in slow, in Paso for them. They go to LA, they go to Silicon Valley, they go out of state. This is an opportunity for us to draw them back, to have them available on a full-time basis for long-term with jobs that pay equivalent to those other areas. So for the university, for myself as a commissioner, this is really exciting stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Gibson. Thank you. I have a two-part question. Uh, and it might have been discussed and I might have missed it, but uh, do we happen to know if there's any, uh, any other, in essence, competition or applicants uh, that have filed on the West Coast uh, that could be, in essence, competing against uh, us for a spaceport? And the second part of it would be, uh, does that actually matter or not? Uh, is there enough demand such that if, uh, say, multiple uh, applicants were on the same track as us, is it... Uh, felt to be that there's such a demand that uh, that wouldn't matter. Mayor, uh, with your permission, uh, I don't know of any competition on the West Coast. Does Vandenberg 
Uh, I'm going to interrupt after just quickly. The speaker is Stu Witt, who was introduced to you previously. For the people who are listening in, may not be able to see you or know who you are. Go ahead. Uh, Stuart Witt, Ridgecrest, California, hired consultant by the uh, city of Paso Robles. Uh, Bill, you may know the answer to that also. I don't, I don't know of any applicants on the West Coast uh, that have even expressed an interest. That's the short answer. And your correct answer is what is that? Because it... it um, so, I'm sorry, Bill. If you needed to... Get into your microphone here and please identify yourself. I'm an IT you. guy. I'm not used to this. I know, but okay. people want to minds want to know. So so, so the, the aspect of nor does it matter is really about if the FAA builds out the way it's anticipated. They're looking at a future state similar to the number of airports we have, we would have as spaceport delivery mechanisms. The interesting thing, though, and what Stu will talk about later, is access over water. There's a lot of spaceports being developed with a long ride to get over water. We don't have that problem. So again, we have a significant up that, that gives us something that others will be looking for. And we'll get into the technical aspect of that in the next round. Any other questions, Phil? Anyone else who has a comment, question? Stu. John. Stu, stay right there. John. <laughs> yeah, that, I did have a question for you and relating to this item with regard to uh, LOIs. In the scheme and the scope of acquiring license, does it enhance FAA's posture toward past robles with a, a list of letter of intents, in other words, people who want to line up? Is it important that we do that right now, or is it yeah. Yes, short helpful? answer, yes. And the reason is that the, uh, they have a lot of applications. They have a limited workforce. They will give credibility to an applicant that has a credible launch platform, keyword. Credible. Credible. Okay. And to the gentleman who asked the question about does it matter, my answer is no. Uh, I went after this gig uh, 20 years ago, the 2nd of April, 20 years, with the intent that I was going to play the game like Tiger Woods was playing golf. I'm sure he's aware that there's other golfers on the course, <laughs> but he plays his game, and over time he wins more than he loses. That's how I approached it. Thank you. Councilman Strong? Yes, thank you. And uh, I'm very impressed with all the presentation thus far. And for those who don't know, I sit at the national level as the transportation uh, director for the National Association of Regional Councils. That's all the regional governments of the United States. And I sit there on their board of directors representing the state of California, as well as sitting on the National League of Cities transportation uh, policy committee uh, and have brought this same topic there. One thing I found in working with the administration, and, and we do work with the administration, I personally just about two weeks ago was uh, in the room uh, talking, well, being talked at actually by uh, uh, Buttigieg and Pelosi and by but, uh, their chiefs of staff actually engaged with us. So we have a lot of things happening. One of the things we found out is that the FAA is extremely interested in pushing spaceport technology forward and the spaceport creations forward. This is very high on their list, and, and their department is working hard. It's very, very low staffed, which is their biggest problem. So you want to get that application in as early as you can and keep pushing it forward because you don't want it to get bogged down. Um, the one thing that we learned, or that I learned up there, is that we are about 40 years behind in our overall infrastructure in the United States regarding transportation. But this is one area where we're doing pretty well worldwide. And this is one of the things we're very interested in, especially now with a shift in our policy away from Russia, which has been a partner at some times in some of this, and which we will no longer have as a partner if the administration proceeds in the way in which it's not moving. So this becomes even more important in the world scene, not just for past roles and not just for our region. And I think it's important for everybody to understand that the whole nation does look at this sort of thing as something very desirable and that they hope comes to fruition. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments? Mr. Gregory? I'm ready to make a motion, Your Honor, when 
It's a good time. I'd like to first start out with a thank you for Mr. Britton applying to the Airport Commission. <laughs> he really helped us sail this where we're, we are today, so thank you for that. Uh, with that, I'll make, I'd like to make a motion. We authorize the mayor to sign the attached nine non-binding letters of intent with Wagner Star Industries, with Cal Poly on behalf of the city of Paso Robles, in support of the potential Paso Robles spaceport, and delegate signing authority to the mayor to execute future non-binding spaceport-related LOIs. I'll second that. I've got a motion by Councilman Gregory, and he just edged you out for it. Second by uh, Councilman Hammond. There's no further discussion. Roll call vote of the council, please. Council Member Gregory? Aye. Council Member Hammond? Aye. Council Member Garcia? Aye. Council Member Strong? Aye. Mayor Martin? Aye. Measure passes 5-0. Thank you very much. Item number two, a related issue, presentation of the spaceport license preliminary technical review. Mr. Sloan is back on your court. I am going to pass the clicker over to our guests from the technical side of things. We have Mr. John Smith from Tartai Engineering and Mr. Stu Witt. Uh, Mayor Martin, members of the council, members of the Planning Commission, and members of the Airport Commission. John Smith, Tartalia Engineering, thank you very much for inviting us out to present tonight, and thank you for the opportunity to participate in this very exciting endeavor. As Paul mentioned, Tartalia Engineering and myself have been serving the city of Paso Robles at the airport for the last 38 years. I have personally known Roger Oxborough for 22, having uh, first met him when we decided to snake the uh, runway lighting conduit, conductor out of the conduit with a shop vac, a garden hose, <laughs> and some homemade tools from Roger's shed. <laughs> so again, thank you very much. Uh, as an overview, Tartali Engineering was requested to participate or to, to support uh, a feasibility study, feasibility level evaluation and assessment. Uh, let me do this. <clears throat> feasibility uh, level evaluation and assessment for a, a, a uh, horizontal platform uh, spaceport license for Pass Robles Airport. We were tasked to flush out any fatal flaws and I can uh, gladly say this afternoon, this evening, that to date based on our evaluation, we have not found any fatal flaws. Um, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Stu Witt, but before I do, I want to, in public to acknowledge how much I've enjoyed uh, working with Stu Witt to this point. Uh, he is quite a, a, a recognized individual, and I am thrilled that he's on our team, and I think he will continue to serve the City of Paso Robles in your pursuits of Spaceport, if that's your plan uh, going forward. Stu? Good evening again, Mayor, uh, Council members, members of the Planning Commission and the Airport Commission. It's a pleasure to be back. Uh, and also, uh, Ty, it's been a pleasure uh, fielding your phone calls through this process as well and your questions. Uh, I made a commitment to John when he approached me. I think it was in September. If I was interested, had the time to uh, assist with this feasibility study to try to uncover any fatal flaws. And the first time I, he said Paso mm -hmm. Robles, I said, huh, interesting. Um, and I came to an initial meeting at the airport with the uh, mayor and uh, uh, John uh, Councilman Hammond and the members of the different departments in the airport and the college and Bill. And we had a pretty neat exchange of ideas and gave me a sense of uh, what it was you were really trying to do. On the feasibility component alone, John's the engineer. I took a look purely from the practicality of could we operate from a Paso Robles? Could we actually uh, fly a droned or manned vehicle carrying a payload out to the warning areas? And what would be a route? So uh, don't laugh everybody, but when I did the same at Mojave inside the restricted airspace, I got in my airplane and I went up and flew day after day trying to find a route with low human density that had low rates of 
commercial or commercial or military jets operating in the areas and to actually came up with plausible routes. The route, one of the routes we came up with is currently the route that Virgin Galactic uses to launch Launcher One from Mojave, cross California with a liquid rocket under the wing of a 747 and pursue out to the ocean. So I remember how that happened. And it's sometimes it just got to go get in your airplane and go figure it out. So if you saw a red and white Mooney flying around on occasion, <laughs> uh, doing orbits over the airport or uh, taking a look through the Hunter Leggett areas and out over the coast. Uh, that's exactly the method I used. And uh, then we got into the books, uh, made calls to the FAA. I was a little bit surprised to find out that the three people leading licensing, environmental, and uh, a launch and re-entry licensing all had offices in Mojave <laughs> during my tenure when they were <clears throat> starting out with the FAA. So I know some of the people we'll be dealing with. That was comforting. But what I really wanted to know was uh, what makes a credible application in today's world? When I applied, we were the first. So nobody thought we could do it. We got laughter when we had rooms of people like this. They're crazy, Mojave, and uh, they're not laughing anymore. We created seven astronauts in Mojave. I don't know how many satellites Bill can probably tell you that they've launched from Mojave out off to the coast. But what I was worried, what I really cared about were the 3,000 jobs. And that supported Lancaster, Palmdale, Roseman, Tehachapi, Cal City, and Ridgecrest. They came to the region. So uh, I'll tell you, Mayor, I, I wish, I mean, I live in a town that's the exact same size as Paso Robles. I wish we had the direction and speed you have in Paso. It's impressive, and I like working with high performance teams with bold ideas. And, uh, you're all in one room, and I haven't heard anybody against it. That's a good thing, I, and you gotta keep it sold. This is not something, uh, there's gonna be some obstacles, there's gonna be some challenges, I guarantee it. And uh, <clears throat> it's worth it. So anyway, I looked at the airport. Uh, John looked at where you actually put things, like with, with Roger, like uh, explosive siding. Right now, Roger houses aviation fuel and jet fuel. But these rocket companies uh, a lot of times show up and build their own rocket cocktails, as I call them. At one time, we had 17 different rocket companies testing different cocktails. I don't frankly see that happening in Paso. I think that R&D in a lot of cases can take place out in the middle of nowhere where it should take place. But putting it in practice or when you get down to building engines for repositioning satellites on orbit. You know those CubeSats? You saw them right back there. A lot of these motors are small, very similar. You can put them right here and you can test it right there. So I want the community to, to know there's, a, there's a, a very broad and diverse definition of rocket motors and how they're used and what your employment base might be developing and where it fits into a bigger industry. And I don't think in fact, I spent way too much time worried about what are we actually going to be flying out of here, and I should have been more focused on building the infrastructure to house any of these different capabilities. Uh, uh, I don't think we need to sit here and try to define which one of these pictures is going to make it to the, to the finals in commercial operation. That's what I'm saying. Um, a lot of this stuff, and, and we looked at when can you start, in order to make a timeline that I believe is pretty close. Somebody asked, a gentleman asked a question about the timeline of, of a license. Uh, I worked with the FAA. I've been flying airplanes 52 years, actually 53 now. Um, a lot of my friends were with the FAA. I love working with the FAA, but they're not happy until you're not happy. And the, and the, the process is, is, it can be, extended, and it won't, it won't be on your timeline, I will tell you that, but you can get there, and you got to stick to it. Um, Pam Milroy, I heard her name mentioned. You went, you went to Pam. Well, Pam's now the deputy administrator in NASA. Pam and I served uh, over two years on a hypersonic study. Uh, I saw a chart from Bryce Aerospace. Paul had that in his, his stack, uh, the owner of Bryce, good friend of mine, and uh, uh, 
Pam's a wonderful person to be an advocate for our industry. She worked as George Neal's deputy at AST and a great friend of the industry. The relationships we need to, to really dwell on in the, in the, as soon as we can, I think they're big chunks. Identifying a vehicle, identifying a plausible route for the licensing activity out to the warning areas. And just because I went and flew and found my route doesn't mean that's the route where we're going to end up. But it might be a good starting point. Relationships with Hunter Leggett, relationships with the Naval Air Warfare Center Point Lagu Range Department, Andy Corsine. <laughs> Good news is uh, we've met, you could say. And uh, he just recently left the land range at China Lake and now ranches the sea range at Magoo. Those, those kind of things are going to be the essential building blocks that should get started early. Uh, John, did I miss anything of importance, sir? No, I think you're doing great. Okay. So, and on the vehicles, the class of vehicles, there. Yeah, those, are in, those are intended to be artist renditions, let's just call it that at this point. Don't get hung up on what's going to be in the picture. Uh, there will be vehicles in the picture that will be capable of like, taking off from runways and delivering them to either suborbit or orbit by some mechanism in the near future. Uh, I wouldn't get hung up on any of the pictures you've seen so far. Just rest assured, there's plenty of them out there and with the entrepreneurs and the money behind the space industry. Uh, I remember in 2000, George Neal and I having a discussion that there was not a single commercial launch in the United States in the year 2000 or 2001. I think we went three years. Compare that to the last year and what's been happening because of the Elon Musk effect on the space industry and three vertical sectors in our society. Electric vehicles, solar panels, and battery technology. Uh, it's funny, all those things are needed in space. They're also the biggest application is on Earth. And so the benefit to any investment the nation makes in space usually has a greater benefit on Earth. And the, those are my big takeaways. Um, planning and permitting. Uh, again, now that gets into uh, John's bailiwick. Uh, he's in, in my initial meeting at the airport when y'all called me over here. And it was a pleasure to be here and meet you. I told you a couple things. Number one, I didn't think you needed a license, but I've been convinced otherwise that really a nice thing to have. And uh, George Neal convinced me, Bill, that it's a good thing to have. And he was right. Um, another thing you need is a, a civil engineer that knows where all the bones are buried at Rogers Airport. And I had one at Mojave Day. Russell used to be a colleague at John's. and. Uh, I'm glad you have somebody that's been doing that business at that airport for a long time because it will pay dividends during this cycle. Um, neighborhood and community buy-in. Um, in Mojave, the elevation and the population have uh, been the same for 100 years and they've been changing at the same rate. Here in Paso Robles, you have a, you have a, a much more progressive uh, uh, population that uh, is, you want to grow it. Uh, you got to get this right because there's some aspects that there's a fear factor of having space activity in the backyard. And I think how Paul, from the economic development component, the mayor, the council, the policies you set really do matter. And that's why I didn't even take a look at vertical launch. I mean, I don't even know if it was said in the, in the beginning, but I didn't even consider it. I think there's going to be plenty of business in the horizontal launch. And that's just another airplane. And when I took it to my board once upon a time, Mojave at that time was pretty sleepy. It was a converted Marine Corps air station, and they were doing three or four movements a day. That's on the FAA logs. I told them I wanted to change that number to 40 and see if anybody noticed. And when we got to 40, I wanted to take it to 400 and see if anybody noticed. Today they're doing about 500, no complaints. But you understand all those numbers, don't you? And it's, we did it without impacting local operations. I think you can do the same thing here, and that was, that was exactly how I approached this, this study. And my job was to look for fatal flaws on the air side. Could we operate? The one thing, and I'm gonna turn it over to John, was the Shumash, the 
yes. Marine Sanctuary. And I think you need to hit that because uh, John discovered that and I've had a lot of current event activity working with SHPO and, and the like. Go ahead on that. Thank you, Stu. Uh, as we, as Stu just mentioned, we did identify one potential challenge. That is the uh, proposed Chumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuary. It is uh, progressing. It is intended to start along the south coast around Goleta, extend west and north all the way up past Morro Bay to Cambria, where it will co-join the, the southern end of the Monterey Bay Marine Sanctuary. Uh, I would encourage that if, if there's an intention to proceed with this, I would encourage that we get a hold of NOAA and, and the people leading that, that effort as soon as possible to secure uh, some level of authority or some level of, of permission prior to the culmination of, of their establishment as a National Marine Sanctuary. As Stu mentioned, uh, all of this discussion is focused on a, a launch activity out over the ocean. It would be unfortunate if we could not get there, or if that became a barrier that then added another year or two to the permit process. Can I add one comment? Absolutely. And the reason it's important is issuing a spaceport license is a federal, a major federal action. That's the legal term, and the attorney's not in the room, but a major federal action triggers a full EIR. And if you have an application to extend a marine sanctuary underneath your launch point, it's going to become a matter, it's going to be a consideration for this, uh, this activity. That's all it is. So in addition to reviewing uh, the launch corridors out to the coast, we did do a, a cursory review of the airfield and evaluation. Your pavement strengths are certainly adequate to support the type of aircraft that has been presented to you this evening and that is under consideration for horizontal platform. In addition, it is also adequate for the larger aircraft that could be entertained for transport of space-centric components from past Robles uh, to a, another launch facility that has the capability of launching heavier uh, space components. So your pavements are fine. Uh, one of the things that would, we would start out early on would be to establish your 1,200 foot standoff zone. That is a, uh, it's a, a body free, human free zone from the time uh, right before loading fuel to the point of, of uh, departure from the airfield, 1,200 feet centered around the actual aircraft. Uh, it, it, we would want to designate that. We would expect that there would be an expansion to emergency response facilities both on the airport and in the community. This is going to take a, a community effort with regards to emergency response uh, and that there would uh, be some enhancements to airport perimeter security. The goal here is to try to cohabitate with, with what you have been experiencing at Paso Robles Airport for the, for the last 50 years. Uh, to be to be uh, 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 co and, and not not overwhelming it, what's going on there now. Um, we would expect that on airport areas we, we would want to further identify some of the undeveloped or underdeveloped properties on the airport and designate them for perhaps R and D, some manufacturing, some testing, uh, and uh, definitely identify where your your fuel storage or your highly energetic fuel storage would occur. Uh, we, it's interesting when you talk about the numbers of operations. Uh, it's hard to say, it's hard to pin that down. I think this uh, Wednesday morning group has thrown out several numbers and I, I applaud the, the, the higher the number, why not? Uh, let's don't limit ourselves. But, but even at the higher numbers, I think we're talking four or five at, at the most a month perhaps, which is quite aggressive, but let's, let's do that and let's see how it goes. And then perhaps in five years, we're at this meeting telling the same story that Stu Witt just told about, about Mojave, where four became 40. Um, we anticipate your, your runway length, which is always an interesting thing. Your runways are long enough, but should this, I hate to use the phrase, should this take off? Uh, your airport master plan, your airport layout plan, does include uh, FAA approved runway extensions to both of your runways. So that could happen in the future. That's not a goal of this, please understand that, but that's just a, a fact that your airport layout plan does have a vision component 
with extended runways. Um, all right, going forward, um, any, anything on airfield? It, 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 the question came up, at Mayor, at our original meeting at the airport, and that how many launches per year? Did anybody remember having that discussion? And I said, my license request had six per year. And Mojave has never had more than three licensed events per year in 20 years. Yet, they've made seven astronauts and I don't know how many satellites have made it to space. The operators that developed there were doing R&D. Uh, Spaceport America and Virgin still intends to fly these things three times a week. And I think they'll get there, but this is, a, this is quite a journey. The small set business, I think, is doable at a much higher rate, but I, I still don't think it's going to be daily operations or even close. So going forward, we recommend continued research into your potential uh, vehicle, your potential partner with the platform. Uh, it will make your application uh, more credible. Um, we we uh, propose uh, or encourage research into the marine sanctuary situation. Let's let's uh, get that behind us if we can. Um, like to initiate contact with Point Magoo for securing airspace authority for the launch out over the ocean. Um, perhaps further definition of some airspace corridors between Paso Robles and the coast, and uh, further uh, refinement of definition of on airport space-centric facilities and areas. Uh, also, we would like to propose that a uh, operational summary of, of just how a spaceport could operate at Paso Robles Air, Airport uh, be, be produced, and it could alleviate some concerns uh, about, about being able to get along with what's out there now. A couple of images of, of uh, space-centric things. Love it. Uh, for those that want to sign up, please get a hold of Paul Sloan. He's the economic development manager. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Uh, the uh, proposed licensing schedule. This was in the report that was part of the staff report. Uh, and the, the green box was right to the crux of how long. Uh, we're looking at June of 2024. Um, as mentioned earlier, this is not a straight line point to point. This is a circuitous route. We don't know all of the uh, objects and challenges ahead of us, but I feel very pleased to know that Mr. Witt is here on this team with his years of experience and how to make this happen. What else? We've, we've completed phase one, which was the feasibility analysis. We've uh, recommended a phase two between now, uh, we're already late, um, between now and June to continue to, to keep some momentum going. This Wednesday morning group with uh, Mayor Martin and Councilman uh, Hammond, uh, very energetic group, uh, very positive momentum going on. We would like to encourage you to keep that going forward. Uh, there are some of the tasks we recommend to complete in the very near future, followed by phase three. Those phase three and phase four are fiscal year tied. Uh, again, th those two numbers are more budgetary. It's truly hard to put some firm definition to what the tasks will be that will consume those budgets, other than what you see there. I and mean, I'm sure this will come back in the Q&A. Uh, do we want to, yeah, so we're, we're going to show you a, uh, an animation, uh, and I've been, I've been encouraged to remind you that this is conceptual only, uh, this does not exist, and, uh, I'd like to honor or recognize Logan Green for, for the production of what you're about to see. We've got Logan and Noli, both young engineers at Tartalia Engineering, very anxious to support what's happening at Paso Robles. <laughs> So go ahead, this, uh, I think you might find this quite interesting and entertaining.
So again, it's a uh, concept of what a spaceport facility could look like. It's, that was positioned over on the northeast side of runway 1331. There's currently nothing over there. Uh, what you might have seen was a new parallel taxiway to that runway that does not exist. And then there was an apron, a couple of buildings, some, some big parking lots, uh, some modern looking facilities for what the space centric businesses would look like or could look like at your airport. Uh, it was a lot of fun, and uh, thank you, gentlemen, for producing that. That was that was nice. Uh, this concludes what what we have as a formal presentation, but we're going nowhere. Uh, Mr. Mayor, thank you very much for the information and for the uh, preliminary technical review. It's got a lot of good information in it. I hope everyone's had the opportunity to uh, review that. Uh, I'll ask now if there are questions of our presenters from council or from the commissions, Mr. Gregory. Yes, Mr. Witt. Could I ask you some questions? Specifically about the routes. I know that uh, the Lemoore uh, Naval Air Station flies out over that sanctuary now, and Hunter Liggett does. Because they're federal, federally related, do they have to get the same permission we would have to get to no, do that? The, the way the law was written and signed by President Eisenhower in 1956, granting the commercial and military rights to the restricted airspace mm -hmm. that you have a legitimate right to get on the schedule. Uh -huh. And it, I think it starts with letter of intent. And uh, I don't know who, you know, you never know the policy. It's like reading the Constitution. Who thought of that? And uh, uh, it's very interesting how that language is worded. But, uh, you know, every time Boeing or anybody builds a new airliner, it's out at Edwards. There was one up there flying today in the restricted area behind the uh, some other airplane, and, and uh, they test all the commercial airplanes out there, just like military airplanes, and it's, it's routine in nature. You just have to get on the schedule. But the rates we're talking about on a not-to-interfere basis, I just I can't imagine it being a problem. Okay. Thank you. Councilman Hammond? Yes, too. That's kind of where I was going to talk about, too. This corridor that we're talking about, I think it's going to be really critical to get through the Hunter OMA and, and on out to the uh, ocean, of course, and... I mean, is it something that when you apply for this that it's permanent or do we just use it at certain times? We notify and, and then we are able to use the corridor. Is that how this works? Yeah, it's, it starts with a visit. The FAA owns all the airspace, airspace over the continent. It's called national airspace. They can designate areas for special use and then they have scheduling authority over that special use. But the FAA still owns it. So the way I started, I went to the air route traffic control center in Palmdale, which was LA Center. I've also been to Oakland Center. It would start with a visit to both, frankly, because you're kind of bridging. The way I looked at the church, you, you're kind of nibbling into, into both both camps. We're right in the middle, yeah. And uh, yeah. it's um, it starts there. And what I learned during that exercise, and I, I said, how can we get spaceships, uh, gliding spaceships back into Mojave? And, and one of the <laughs> controllers with gray hair said, why don't we use the uh, SR-71 return routes, the ACTAs? I didn't even know what an ACTA was. ATC assigned airspace, and they can trigger it and turn it on, turn it off, and it's on the charts. Uh, uh, I think the Hunter Liggett airspace, 24,000 feet, if I'm not mistaken. I think that's going to give you plenty of cushion to get out and then get a tunnel from Oakland Center, activate on demand. You may get an altitude at 220, 240 stay in that tube, you'd be in it for a minute, and then you're not. And it's, it's like um, when they commercialize uh, commercial launches out of Kennedy Space Center, it was one thing when only the military and NASA were launching, you had commercial launchers, and the rate started going up. There was a time when, and, and Bill, you're gonna jump in here, there's a 45th and the 30th, I think, in the, in the test wings, and they had range departments, and for a rocket going up vertically, they would shut down the airspace in case they had a, an anomaly in a large debris field airborne to the deep water routes. Those are the airliners coming in from Africa, South America, up the eastern seaboard from Europe. Same thing in the Pacific, from Asia, Hawaii, uh, and alike coming inbound. These airliners don't have a lot of fuel to maneuver by the time they're getting to our shores. They're, they're getting min fuel. And so in order to block off that airspace, you're basically holding them on a ramp 14 hours away and delaying a takeoff. And 
we were able in the, in the 450 regulations, and they came out on launch and reentry. The airline unions protested loudly on that, and we've been able to get those those corridor restrictions reduced from hours to like two minutes, three mm-hmm. minutes. It's like turn right two degrees for three minutes and then back on course. Nobody notices. Mm-hmm. So, but it took the industries working together to solve that stuff, and the centers know how to do that now. They. You go to the controllers and ask them, they'll solve it. And I, I know you mentioned also, which is kind of a, something that could happen, in other words, a, a total failure on the, on the spacecraft, where, and so you got to figure out where it's going to fall that's right. within that quarter or two, and that's a consideration for where we're going to go. Yeah, and in my report, I think I called out, if I could pick out a couple players for the mayor to, who would do what in this, in this license, Cal Poly already builds... CubeSats, I'm sure they have some way of controlling and monitoring these on orbit. I think the control will not live at Cal Poly. And uh, the other part of your question, I just went blank. Well, just where it's going to fall if we do have Yeah, a, a and then the failure. analysis, that now the, the second by second analysis. Now, we may not have to do it during the site license exercise on 420, but if you graduate to 450 and you have an operator you're using, they will. And you're going to need Cal Poly's math department on that. Mm-hmm. They've turned that into higher order math, Great and yeah. that's a big deal. Okay. Okay. Planning Commissioner Davis. I have a question. I'm not quite sure how to ask it. This is all very exciting information, um, and I think maybe you addressed some of uh, my question when you talked to John about airspace with Hunter Liggett and Camp, Camp Roberts. You know, I look at them as part of our um, economic vitality here. They're stakeholders. How is this a benefit to them too? I mean, could you kind of explain the dynamics with those two local installations? Uh, I can't speak for them because I haven't met with them. Right, right. But my experience is these are people just, this is their community. They want to be a part of it. I mean, why was China Lake tracking the Spaceship One flights with their Cinethialites and their high altitude cameras? And that's what you saw on TV through fiber laid on the ground at the airport and they were taking it and linking it to China Lake and they were sending it out to the world. Why did they do that? We didn't even ask them to do it. They wanted to be a part of something cool. Mm-hmm. And my, my that's just, that's the only thing I, that's the only answer I have for that question. Yeah. These are people in your community. They, they buy groceries, same stores, they send their kids to the same schools and they, they want to share in something that's pretty neat. It's the future. You can be a part of it here. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Mr. Britt. The secondary benefit is that Space Force is an emerging force structure within the United States Department of Defense. What we see is there is a secondary effort to have a National Guard and a reserve component of Space Force. That actually makes the mission that they do here a viable component for the National Guard or the reserve force to design launch capability that they could take advantage of and not have to go through the heavy lift phase, but go through uh, basically a horizontal lift. So this is a whole new mission that they could be looking at as a potential for them. And I think it also something that's a benefit is, is every one of those ranges to the military is like a continuing fight to keep those ranges without having somebody else uh, venture into it and control it or help them control it. This is another mission that would give them the benefit of we have this support mission. That's why that range needs to stay available for us in the Department of Defense, because we have these specialized missions. So it's a benefit for them for keeping that. And and one other thing that the mayor has done is he's he's started a working group with those entities where he meets with them and discusses these kinds of opportunities. And, And I agree completely with Mr. Witt that they are members of the community and they want to see us do well and this benefits them in the long run. Other questions? Mr. I asked wrong? Mr. Mayor. Well, excuse me. Oh, Stu, go ahead. To that point, the, there was one concept, uh, one of Gary Hudson's three space companies. Uh, and I know, don't laugh. Okay. But Gary built a rocket that was dropped out of the back of a C-17 at Edwards Air Force Base. The Air Force wanted to be a part of that and part of the quick, quick reach program because they were looking at all viable options. Um, I was interviewed by the Times yesterday, and I haven't read that article. I don't know any idea what their intent was, but that hour-long interview. And one of the one of the, uh, the questions.
questions is, is that the industrial base that supports national defense, national security, intelligence, and commercial space is one industrial base. Can't separate it. If you broaden the base, the cost goes down for everybody. And to Bill's point, to the ranges as well, people are starting to understand it's good business for all. Thank you. Councilman Strong and then uh, Commissioner Christensen. Yes, uh, along that same line, aren't these units that we're putting up there to gather information, many of them? And if they gather information, is not information one of the basic things to national defense, to military operations? It's a, the Space Force is absolutely trying to look at this whole green light, please. Thank you. The whole uh, IT. Yeah, the Space Force is looking at this entire challenge of what's going on in the low Earth orbit, which is what most of these platforms would be looking at. Most of them are communications. More importantly, the market that's evolving is Internet from space. And, and so what we see is this market would deliver ones and twos into space which is very important if you're running um, an entire swarm or you have a constellation of multiple platforms that rely on five birds to be transmitting. And say one of those falls out or, or goes down early, this kind of launch could supplement the military, the commercial, and others to provide that onesie, twosie effort to replace. So, so again, it has a significant meaning for the future. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Christensen, then Councilman Hammond. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just a general question, not to get too far into the weeds. Do you foresee this as changing maybe our airspace classification, or do you think that it does, an, does that end up being a requirement as part of this process, or what do you foresee in that in that aspect? Your airspace? If you get a spaceport license, you're going to put a little rock on the sectional chart right over your airport. Literally, that's how you're designated. There's 13 of those. Um, to the national airspace, uh, when I started flying... If you could get above 180, you could go anywhere you want and didn't have to talk to anybody. That's how long I've been flying. You can remember that too. Then they raised the airspace control. Now it's 60,000 feet because the performance of airplanes keeps going up. Uh, when Secretary Ross was Secretary of Commerce and had plenty of time with him and, and discussing this very subject and with uh, the Secretary of Transportation, I think it's a natural evolution as a performance of vehicles and we, and we start moving people in suborbit or point to point suborbit or point to point in the ignorosphere. It's a term we've made up because we typically go through it quickly and come back through it quickly because operating there, we don't have a lot of experience and it has some nasty characteristics, but we're getting there. And uh, as we do that, the airspace will continue and control the airspace will continue to rise. It's a natural thing. So you don't foresee, like, for example, as a Class B airspace or something to that level that will be uh, changing our classification because of the amount of traffic? Do you foresee that in the future? I, I don't think that would apply here. If you had an operating control tower, you'd have Class C. Uh, class B, I, I would have pushed way back on that in Mojave. And that kind of led to my question. I mean, you foresee like a tower taking us to Class C. I could see that being an infrastructure yeah, there, there's, requirement. There's a, there was, in my view, Mojave didn't have a tower at one time. Then they had a tower and they got rid of the tower, then I brought it back. And when you start doing the kind of operations and the mix, I wanted somebody keeping an eye on things. And everybody, oh, you're going to change everything. You know what? It's just... It was good business. And then we put cameras everywhere. We filmed every takeoff, every landing, every special event. Those cameras were priceless. And I think that's just growing up with the world. And, and, I mean, Roger, you can comment anything you want here. But uh, I, I'd live through the, all those comments. Uh, I don't think you're going to see Class B. FAA wanted to put up a TFR every time we did something. And, I push back on that. I think there's there's a time and place for that, but you use, you use that very judiciously because that all of a sudden becomes the norm, and I don't think that was intended to be the norm. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Councilman Hammond, then Airport Commissioner Dart. Yes, Stu, that's exactly where I was going. I mean, we have a blessed that we have a lot of aviation-oriented commissioners and current pilots, too, and 
I think what they're going to be thinking about is how's this going to impact my flying? In other words, if an event happens or is scheduled, can you give us a scenario on what Mojave does? In other words, TFRs, does that happen on every one of those or does it not need to be done? Or what's the overview of a particular day of the launch? Maston Space Systems is going to fly a lander to the South Pole of the Moon Q4 this year on a Dragon, uh, on a Falcon. They've been testing since 2007 in Mojave. I don't think we've ever put a TFR up for them, and they fly those things point to point across the airport. They just, we have, we, we I still say that, but the, the operations there has a way to do that safely and keep everything going at the same time. Is the airport shut down at the time of launch? No. Okay. So no. they take their turn just yeah, like Yeah, if, uh, I think when the, I, I say with certainty, when the uh, 747 of Virgin goes into hazard operations and they start loading liquid fuels up the belly of that 747, the FAA measures net explosive weight, and it's the combine of the jet fuel, it's combined of the locks on board, falls from the overhead if you're in the cabin. Uh, it's everything that has an explosive net effect. And uh, then the liquids under the, under the wing. And so they clear an area that's rather large all the way across to the coast as this thing flies along. But again, did you ever notice that? Hmm. That's my point. The controllers know how to do their job. We give them the challenge and they figure it out. Then maybe a follow-up question with regard to the public and general public around town. What would they expect from a particular event that happens out here at the airport? That's a question for that man in his training. An event to me is uh, maybe not a good thing. Uh, an event that goes well and nobody knows about it, perfect day. Uh, one of the questions I had is, the training to your local fire department, interagency agreements, uh, in the surrounding, it's all in the report. Uh, we called it out. But those are all part of the licensing process. You've got to prove that to the FAA. Uh, what do you mean by event? Maybe well, our definition is I'm not going to say an incident, but no, I'm saying okay, basically we're a saying launch. The same thing. In other words, you know, noise I'm thinking of, uh, impacts, yeah. things like that. Uh, these small little aircraft, I think, would be minimal. And do they work. complain when a jet takes off? No. Well, it's the same airplane. To get them out to that spot off the coast, it's going to take an air-breathing vehicle that can has a performance to get up to a certain height. Uh, a rocket off the runway going 30 miles, I'd question whether that's a viable concept for the, what I've looked at to get off coast because you got to fly through endoatmospheric to get there. That's a long ride for a rocket in today's technology. Yeah. I, I'll happy to take that offline. I'm sure that's into the weeds for a lot of people. But well, just, I think what we're trying to do is make sure that where we're going with this whole application, it's not going to be um, repulsive, I guess is what I'm saying, to Roblins or people who don't care about aviation at all, that sort of thing. We have to deal with those as well. But, I mean, it's a great opportunity. I definitely want to see this happen. But I'm just trying to uncover anything that might have happened or that, you, in your knowledge, that has happened over in Mojave area. Mojave's a different beast. It, I gave people ridiculous authority to test things that could make a substantial and disruptive dis, uh, change in an industry. Uh, I have to live with the results of that, but it changed the world. And now there's vehicles coming along using different techniques, of the lessons learned, can be used by places like Passer Robles. I don't see this as an R&D center. Right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Dart. Yes, thank you, Mr. Witt, for your presentation. Um, I have a few questions, but I'm going to tag on a little bit to what John was asking and just ask uh, about a lot of these vehicles that we're looking at are unmanned vehicles. Do you have any experience with the unmanned launches and how that affects airspace? Because I would imagine uh, airspace that unmanned vehicles are flying in is probably going to be treated a little bit differently. Yeah. So well, when I took over Mojave, Mojave was uh, flying F-4 drones, and they were converting them to F-4 drones. We never had one mishap. Uh, they converted F-100s, F-86s, uh, F-9s. 
through the years. Uh, I actually shot down two of those in my career in testing. Uh, those resulted in mishaps of the target, by the way, both of them. Yeah. And uh, that's a good thing, actually. Um, but the, in 1956, Mojave was a naval air station, and it was the Navy's center of, center of excellence for unmanned air systems. That business has stayed in operation to this day by contractors. And the, you know when the FAA went out and established six centers of excellence around the United States for unmanned air systems, I said, well, you've got one now. And uh, those places still exist. And uh, I think it's a natural extension. You know, we're flying, we're flying unmanned weaponized systems off aircraft carriers now. Every day, every night, safely. Uh, I could stand up here with the mic on and make a case that the former chief staff of the Air Force made, and nobody really wanted to hear it. But I remember when he said in a room full of aviators, there's not a single mission the Air Force currently does that couldn't be done with a drone. That wasn't real popular in front of a room of pilots. But that's the state of technology. If, if you ask me to boil down what's the most unsafe thing about flying anymore, it's probably the person at the controls. The systems are relatively uh, well-engineered, proven, and uh, anyway, that's my answer to that. Yeah, well, my question really wasn't re regarding the safety of an unmanned vehicle, but just how that affects the airspace that it operates in. Do you have any unmanned vehicles that operate in the Mojave airspace that aren't in restricted areas or military operating areas? Yes. Do, do, do they? Okay. Yes. And uh, those are called rocket-driven things that are up flying lander missions every day to several thousand feet over and around, and they do it in the Class D airspace. Uh, I live in Ridgecrest. There's a drone flying over my house constantly. Navy flies them all over town. They're up there constantly, 24-7. Uh, in, in 25, uh, uh, Edwards, 25-15, the, the, the reason you can't fly through it every day anymore because they're operating drones up there constantly, seven days a week. And I don't think people realize that. They're up there all the time. And I, don't, I think that's a natural extension of aviation. I think it makes a lot of sense to put some of these things on drones. Thank you. Um, so in the uh, technical review, um, are we kind of using launch platform, launch vehicle interchangeably uh, in there? And that will lead to my next question. Yes. Yes. So um, when you developed the spaceport license for Mojave, did you use, uh, was Spaceship One the launch platform that you identified? That was, how we, that was how we justified the original license. What stage were they at it in 2002? I don't <clears> recall <throat> where they were at in there. Had they already had launches? I, I don't remember. Uh, That's a great question because if anybody, I mean, you probably know Bert Rutan. He came out of Cal Poly. But, I mean, it, Bert decided he was going to fly on significant milestone dates in aviation. He was going to make sure his flights occurred on days that you would recognize. Wright Brothers' first flight, uh, whatever, Sputnik, I don't know. But he had, a, he had a reason for every date he picked. The FAA, it turned out, didn't operate that way. And I remember going back meeting with uh, Mr. Mineta, and he was Secretary of Transportation, Bush administration. And I was with him, and I said, Bert, you're not going to go in here and say bad things about NASA? We're going to go in here and try to get a license because he was going to fly next Tuesday. We didn't have a license. And I, my speech was, Mr. Panetta, I think you got a choice. You can be standing there with your ticket book and write him a ticket and hook him up, take him to jail after going to space if it works. Or you can be standing there and say, that's the America I support. He said, I'll be there with a license tomorrow. He gave us a waiver. They can waiver anything in that organization. The first license was a wavered license. We didn't finish our explosive site uh, handling permit se segment of the license, I think, for two more years. But good ideas have their own momentum, it turns out, once in a while. I think we have the expertise now to, uh, that you do and in, in, in this room and the, in the energy to get a license on your own merits without having to get a waiver. Uh, another question I had was regarding Point Magoo. Uh, does Mojave have an agreement with airspace uh, in their launches through Point Magoo already? Yes. You do? So do you see that as any being any kind of issue for us? I, oh, 
let's figure out issues, but you, we just, we have to work through it. We work together and they got to prove them that you can do this safely and that you are safeguarding the non-involved public and their national assets. I mean, it's, I think the progress, I think the system is rigorous, but essential. And uh, I think it's a good time for anybody to say it. I think somebody from the city needs to own that licensing process so you have somebody to operate it when you get it. Um, so, I, I mean, let me just, you saw, the, you saw the map that there's 13 licensed spaceports? I think there's five that outsource their license activity to third parties in total. Would you care to guess how many have never done space activity at the airport? No, I had that conversation with the mayor of Thai once, but I said it's it's essential. I mean, it's going to be your license that's going to go to the airport. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think from inception, you have to have somebody that owns that license so they know what they're... You don't need a book. You need somebody that understands the knowledge gained from this, from this journey. All right, so my last question uh, is just regarding the process for the uh, spaceport plan of operations. When do the stakeholders, uh, are, can you maybe go over, you know, the process of how stakeholders are involved and how that process will work in formulating those uh, specific operations? Let me give you a, a classic, uh, and I know the fire chief's back here. I've never met your fire chief, but I've worked with fire chiefs. My nephew's fire chief of Kern County just retired. so. But the fact is, somebody has to prove that they could have a three-minute response on airport property of a mishap. And so during a launch event, somebody's going to have to own that process. And it's part of the training, and it's staffing, and it's the equipment. And what we did was so many different cocktails in development. I had trucks loaded with this chemical and this chemical and one with water. We we beat ourselves up trying to be ready for all contingencies and we ran out of staff. Now, ironically, down at the Cape right now, there's the SLS sitting there ready for a hot fire, first hot fire, and there's a Dragon capsule with four Axiom commercial guys and my friend Michael Lopez Alegrea ready to go up space. And NASA and the Cape admitted they don't have the staff to conduct both events a mile and a half away at the same time. This happens at large scale, and it's going to happen at a macro scale. But it's whoever owns emergency response for an event is going to have to be on scene, and they're going to have to prove in the license that they have the equipment, the training to respond. And I, again, I'm not going to tell them how to do it. I'm going to tell them what's being used and the quantities being used and the dates and the time. These guys are professionals. They will figure out. And there's plenty of expertise out there. And the FAA at one time used... Uh, military standard 6055 point whatever on explosive sighting and response. The FAA now adopts NFPA. So he probably likes that. That's from National Fire Protection Standards. Does that help? Is that an example? Yeah, uh, and I was actually more specifically uh, concerned with, you know, the stakeholders such as the users of the airport, pilots, mm. uh, uh, and businesses out there regarding, you know, when we we're talking about, you know, number of launch frequencies, types of launches, uh, things like that. Are we going to be able to bring those stakeholders in together to kind of help formulate this, this license process and kind of how maybe what are the timelines for, for that happening? When, when is that input uh, well, that, kind of given? You're going to have to prove that the FAA. And Pam Melroy was in charge of that when, when we ended up. She used my example to train all the FAA inspectors at AST, and they held a training center out there on how we notify everybody, how we deconflict. And when you're talking about companies, you're not talking about government organizations that want to test a rocket. You have a company, you're for profit, you're for profit, you're for profit. You start telling people to leave their buildings for certain hours during the day, who's going to pay for that? See what I'm getting at? And uh, I think there, there's a real blend of activities here. We're not talking about heavy rockets, vertical launch. We're talking about payloads that may launch out of Paso Robles. They may get transported in a, in a heavy lift to go somewhere else and get stacked on a big rocket and, and go. But the, there's a lot of ways to attack and, and meet the objective of living wage jobs. 
but I, I just don't see vehicles any bigger than a, than a G3, G4, uh, maybe a 737. That would be a big airplane uh, carrying payloads for space. And I, it, it, if a jet landed, I mean, I was standing out there today for an hour, three or four jets landed. I don't think anybody noticed. They sold them some fuel. This would just be another normal activity. Tony, did you want to speak? Thank you. Okay, one second. I have Marshall Hurd. This yes, sir. Marshall Hurd, is Hurd would like to speak. Is He's it, one of the online participants. I'm sorry. Is Marshall a, a team participant or a member of the public? He's a team's right. participant. Okay, so hang on the... just a second, Tony. Marshall, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I didn't want to say a whole lot. I've been listening very carefully. I sort of second everything that's been said. A couple of odds and ends that I'd mention. Um, We've, we've talked all around the two different kinds of licenses, and we touched on it just briefly. 14 CFR, the Code of Federal Regulations 420, covers spaceport licenses. It does not cover launch vehicle licenses for both launch and reentry, and that normally falls to the launch vehicle operator to get those licenses, and the number one concern there is safety. Um, so you, you have your choice. You're going to have to comply with 91.710, which is a DOD uh, situation, or you're going to have to comply with CFR 450. I would also mention that in, in response to some of these questions about ops temp and, and uh, uh, being a bother to other users of the airport, ADSB has made a huge difference in this area. So everybody has to have ADSB at this point. Uh, I would go back and talk about the, the user license for just a second. We've not talked about revenue streams for the, for the spaceport here. And one of the possible revenue streams is for you to be an adjunct to the launch vehicle operator as he gets his launch and recovery licenses. So at some point in time, we ought to talk about revenue streams and then talk about sources of funds that could accrue to the spaceport. And I would tell you what happened in Florida, which was a stroke of genius. The, the Space Florida Commission went to Tallahassee, which is our state capital, and they got space declared a mode of transportation. When that happened, that meant that they were eligible for Department of Transportation funds, both at a federal level and a state level. So you have Caltrans, which to the best of my knowledge today, only recognizes rail, sea, air, and road, and has yet to recognize space as a mode of transportation. So when you start funding some of the infrastructure ideas that you're gonna require, both for the spaceport and for the range functions, you've got a great source of funds providing they recognize space as a mode of transportation. So I commend the mayor for having talked to some of the political supporters, both at the state and federal level, but one of your goals should be to get space recognized as a mode of transportation. Thank you, sir. Could you, uh, for the people listening in, identify your affiliation, please? Yes, I'm, I'm uh, with Wagner Star. I'm a subcontractor from a company called Launch on Demand, and we do indeed provide support uh, to people who want to get a launch vehicle license. Very good. Thank you very much for your information. Uh, Airport Commissioner Gaspar. Uh, yes, Mayor, thank you very much. Um, so, Mr. Witt, a uh, question for you. Uh, it seems to me that uh, people who are concerned about... Uh, the spaceport designation um, have a reason, in a sense, because there's a lot of unknown. This, we're not really defining what the operations of the airport will look like once we get the license, because uh, admittedly the, the aircraft or spacecraft haven't even been designed yet. Is that correct? But, I mean, the, the design is, has not been completed. There's a lot of unknowns. So. With respect to once we get the license, does getting a spaceport designation represent a loss of control for the city? 
for the city council, for our leaders? Yeah, in one regard, I, I can say yes, potentially. And typically in America, land use is retained to the local most jurisdiction. In this case would be the city. You have a planning department, planning commission, and they like to control what goes on in their property. The, what I did was I very carefully defined the spaceport boundary within the airport boundary. Uh, that would, I don't know if that's going to carry water anymore, but I did that for a reason. I, I didn't want them telling me where I could put windmill blades that would end up on Tehachapi Mountain or where I'd put containers or cars that needed a place to sit because they didn't have room for them at the ports. And I, I made money by renting dirt and selling fuel. That's the business I was in. And so I had to make money. Uh, I pushed back on that fairly uh, firmly and, and won that argument. Uh, we'll take a look at that. But if you noticed in the diagram, John very carefully put a diagram around one runway and not the other. I think it, I don't know how that's going to turn out in the final picture. But I will tell you that the FAA will have a say in uh, human density at certain parts of the airport if it intersects with any kind of hazardous operations. And again, I, the spirit and intent of that regulation is thinking vertical rockets, big heavy lift vehicles, a lot of propellant. I just don't see that happening here. The, and Bill, I, I welcome your comments there, but I just, I don't see that those lines intersecting here. Yeah, Bill Britton speaking again. I think the context here, and we've kind of forgotten what we talked about earlier, which is the airport commission and we uh, being the city needed to find, is there gonna be a spaceport commission? What, what's the governing entity that goes along with this? All those decisions are TBD and part of the process that the license doesn't care about. It's how we choose to operate. And that's completely within our control and context. So we don't really give up control of the airport. What we give up is we say it's a spaceport, so it has a spaceport license to operate. As far as operating the airport, how we run it, how we do things, that's still within our context. We have to have a concept of operations. That's something that we need to write. That, that's totally in our control. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. I, I think that answers my question. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Any further questions from the commissions or the council? Yes, sir. Mr. Gibson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So it was mentioned and uh, somebody indicated we might have this conversation or might come up, but let's maybe circle back to the numbers. So I'm looking at the, uh, at the plan and uh, it indicated uh, a relatively smaller amount of, I think, $120,000 for the first few months. And then it jumps up to 1.2 million, then another million or so. But I'm hearing things that pretty much uh, are in line with some of the things I'm concluding that we're going to have to be doing far enhanced emergency services. We need an, uh, a controlled tower. We're going to have to be doing things that are cost millions of dollars. So I'm just curious uh, about the conversation and the discussion as to uh, what uh, the ideas are for how to uh, pay for those, or is that something through the FAA, FAA that we can get grants for the control towers, or what's the thoughts in, in terms of uh, even getting through the initial process of uh, roughly 2.3, 2.4 2 million dollars? Yeah, so if I might answer, uh, I'm gonna step out of role for just a second because I've been involved in some of these conversations. First of all, uh, the preliminary numbers that you see here are significant. Uh, I would just like to say that, um, you know, the potential ROI on, on those funds is many times more significant than that. The process of getting from where we are to getting a spaceport license is totally iterative. Uh, I think it's been uh, discussed earlier this evening. It's not a straight line. We're going to, we're going to run into these challenges where are we going to need another fire truck? We're going to need another fire. Those things we're going to have to handle along the way. And I think what's been presented to us tonight has been these checkpoints where we, we get to here and that sheds more light on the next phase. And we'll be able to make a decision on whether we're gonna go forward from that from that point forward. This is a, uh, and you mentioned the control tower and I'm, I don't wanna put words in their mouth, but we, we visited um, uh, Camp Roberts. And while this type of facility, as I understand it, and somebody tell me if I'm wrong, 
does not require a control tower. Uh, the military installations that I've conversed with, particularly Camp Roberts, offers uh, a level of uh, air traffic control, which they've actually uh, offered us on our airport in the past when we had air shows. They would set up temporary control towers. And when we spoke with them, they're quite interested that if we go forward, that this might provide a place where their personnel could actually work uh, to provide air traffic control services with Passerables Airport. So again, these are all uh, conjectural. These are all uh, potentials in the future. But until we start shining the lights in these corners and seeing where the challenges and the benefits are, it's kind of difficult to read the tea leaves tonight and say, this type of airplane is going to launch. It's going to have this impact. It's going to cost that much. And we're going to make this much from it. I think we're very exploratory right now. And I think as we move on and we get into the, the realm of making larger investments, we'll feel a lot more sure of ourselves as we uh, get more of that data. The other thing I want to, I want to underscore is, you know, uh, the only concern that's been expressed to me, and I'm sure people have different publics they speak to, is a question of what the noise will be. I mean, people think rocket ships blasting off. It's going to be noisy. And I think the answer that was given tonight uh, regarding, you know, did you notice the last jet plane that took off? Uh, I didn't. And so I think we can be reasonably sure that we as a city can define a spaceport operation that will have minimal, if any, impact to our local residents while at the same time preserving the role of the airport we have right now. The questions are, what will the challenges be? Can we afford them? And we're in the process now of getting the answers to those questions. I don't think they're available tonight. I think what's available tonight is the option to explore those questions. So I'll step back into my official role now and ask her if there are any other questions. Don't be shy. Uh, Mr. Mayor? Yes, sir. If I could respond to the tower question. When Please, Governor yes. Richardson brought me in to help him design with his team Spaceport America, I said, Governor, you have your own Army and Air Force. You're the governor. Yeah, but they don't have a mobile control tower. That was the solution. You know, when they do air shows, Air National Guard is happy to come in and set up. They have training. They needed to set it up and run training. Uh, there's a lot of ways to scratch that itch that don't cost any money. And people get the benefit. The service gets the benefit of doing that service for a day, especially if it was, I mean, Camp Roberts is a reserve base, isn't it? A guard base, reserve base? I mean, it, to me, it doesn't take a whole lot of creative thinking to go solve those problems. It don't cost you any money at all. And you might get a higher level of service on by the drink. I, I think that's a great question. But that was my answer back then. And Thank you. And the, I have to say, the number of questions I've asked since the beginning of this process a lot of those have been answered and surprised me. Wait a minute. I mean, you can do that. So it's been a positive process for me so far. Any other questions? Mr. Hammond. Yes. Uh, and I'm going to get to the, the dollar part of this. And maybe staff can help us a little bit. But, you know, we're looking at the next step, 120 grand. That, but then we get into July 2022, the, uh, the next year, a million two. So can we afford it, number one? And I'm going to say probably not, but how can we partner? I mean, um, Bill, I think we were talking about, is there ways that we can grant fund some of this information? And we just talked about the opportunity with Caltrans becoming a, a space transportation, which we might have some funds. Has anybody explored how we might be able to partner with other agencies to kind of get this off the ground? Thank you, Mr. Hammond. Uh, Ty Lewis, your city manager here. Uh, so I think that, you know, we've had some uh, preliminary discussions offline about um, how to fund this, because certainly, as I think we've had in discussions in other council meetings and workshops, uh, that we have a lot of unfunded um, yeah. infrastructure needs throughout the community. Um, certainly, we have a healthy um, reserve that we could, uh, you know, explore uh, how to prioritize that money. I think that's a big discussion we recently had at our goal-setting workshop. Um, economic development and those kind of aspects were a big portion of that. Um, the, the short answer is we do have the money to fund it. The question is where do we want to put that money in to get the, the, the biggest bang for our community. Um, I think that one of the options is that uh, from what I can see is this is a beer, very unique process, um, the way we've undertaken it. We've kind of started a grassroots effort for this. 
A lot of the other space ports that I've seen, you know, usually start off maybe with state interest. Um, then they go down to the county and then they end up at the municipal level. And so they kind of have a coalition of funding identified by the time they get there. Um, so I see a reverse effort um, in that, that, you know, we've had a lot of uh, partners that have expressed interest and given us support, letters of support. I think at some point then it becomes a regional effort and we um, start asking for help. Um, to, to fund this. And then that's where the rubber will hit the road on whether there's enough uh, uh, regional um, and state uh, support to uh, help us see that goal. Um, so that's yet to be identified um, as to whether or not, you know, we'll get those types of uh, partners to step up and help us financially. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I think we need to start um, pounding the ground a little bit to find out, you know, where we can find some partnerships here because I think it's, it's a worthy endeavor. I, I truly think this would be Absolutely great for economic development in the whole Central Coast, but you know, is it just past rubbles or will we have other partners in this thing? And that, that's really where I think we need to have staff to start turning over some dirt and kind of see where we can find some other help and uh, make this thing happen. I mean, I've certainly, at this point, you know, we're talking about 120 grand to go the next step, and I think that's how we should be looking at it as we progress through this. Um, you know, we're spending, we're spending, but there's got to be a time where we're going to have to step back and say, here. Councilman Gregory? Yeah, I think that <clears throat> for tonight's discussion, it's revealing, it's interesting. I want to move forward on it myself, but what I think it's really important for us to do, this is not going to be a check, check it off and go. It's going to be, we need to get to the next point. So I think as a, as a council, we need to say, are we all interested? If we're all interested in doing this, go to the financial stage of this, and it's got to have multiple steps, partners, how we fund it, because you're looking at 120000 to get to the next step, and then we're getting the millions of dollars. And I think as a, as a, a community member in a potential regional spaceport, we need partners. Absolutely. We're going to have to have that. So I think my recommendation, and I'm not going to make a motion, but well, we haven't gone to public no, yet. So. But I want to. I think we should talk about how we, where we go next financially. So I have a couple of questions, but if there are others, we are not in the comment section yet. No, it's we're not. Strictly questions. Right. Just, thank you. So I have a couple of questions, if I might. Um, first of all, we've talked. I mean, we've started to have the conversation and the questions about how much it's going to cost and when it's going to cost it. What I'm wondering is, Stu and John, from your experience, uh, the process itself, once it's begun. Are there benefits that accrue along the way as people realize that you're, you know, you're, you're trying to do this? Is this something that, that draws resources out of the woodwork? Is this something that gets people signing on as early adopters? Would this pr produce allies that perhaps we can't identify tonight? Again, I've always been a forward lean kind of person and I've made a lot of mistakes. Everybody seems to focus on the successes. They weren't around to witness or remember the, what it took to get there. But the, there's a spillover benefit to a really good idea. And when the, the, biggest, the biggest attractant I see is you have an underutilized spaceport down the road. You have a university building space components in your backyard and you have the will of the people to convert something and, 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 and focus on the future, those are, those are not bad places to start. And as you start down this process in the light of day where you will, and uh, I, I've even said to John, I, I don't know your community, you know your community. But I called Roger one day and, and uh, we, we chatted about this a minute and and uh, I, I talked to the city manager, and I'll be br brutally open with you. I, as you have the, the dollar discussion, if I were in your shoes, I think the first thing I would do is invest in an employee of the city that would manage this licensing process that could be used to be an airport manager or operations director. I don't know, I don't know what you have at the airport. I, uh, I understand Roger is uh, is leaving sometime soon. I think that's going to be a, 
a big loss in history and corporate knowledge of the airport, but somebody needs to own this from the beginning. And that might be the safest investment. I know when John asked me to price this, I figured what it would cost me to do it, and I'm not looking for another job. I've got a full-time job and I run my own company, but I'd, I'd I've told you on the phone, I'd love to be there. I don't want you to make the mistakes I made. I want you to have somebody that could lean on, that knows all the players, but that's the role. Uh, you don't have to hire me at my rate. You can buy an employee that for the long term might be the best decision you can make as a starting point. And uh, I can even help you there. Okay, thank you, sir. That, a quick question. Yeah, John. Mayor. Yeah, Stu, this is in our initial meeting, we talked about a parallel track. Testimony tonight, though, you said that and you've come to believe that maybe the license is pretty important. Yeah. I mean, you're still standing by that, that we were originally we were going to do parallel track to try and you know get the license, but also move forward with getting more energy going with other companies that would want to come here. Is that obviously still in the picture? Yeah. It, Stephen Ambrose, nothing like it in the world, building of the Transcontinental Railroad during the middle of the Civil War when the nation was broke and divided, and we built a Transcontinental Railroad. Um, I think there's some great lessons learned from those periods. And there's nothing stopping Paul from recruiting these high-tech businesses to your community, and I would leverage the work going on at Cal Poly. Cal Poly. To me, if you're building an industrial park, and you've, you know where people go? They go where they're wanted. They go where they're asked. They go where they're encouraged, and it makes sense. That, that is what it's at the root of your vision is living wage jobs in a tech society that will map to the future. And there's absolutely nothing. And I think he's doing it. That, that's what encourages me. Uh, the parallel steps are getting the license. And, and uh, it, it's just my advice is uh, the, one, the one critical element is that the engineering firm you've got, because he's, he's got all the charts and all that stuff you're going to need to do the designing. He does it anyway. <coughs> Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I'm trying to answer both those. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Councilman Hammond, uh, I, I want to reiterate what your your question. Uh, yes, we firmly believe in the parallel track. We still believe in that. The the one track being the the horizontal platform to space, but the parallel track being a space centric in, industrial zone that is building components for shipment on an aircraft to another launch facility. Absolutely. And to the mayor's question, uh, you have a momentum with your spaceport discussion, whether it's the Wednesday meeting, whether it's a uh, Tuesday night meeting that's going for, for a long time, whether it's Paul Sloan's activity while he's on the phone calling all these entities. You are attracting business interests from far afield. I'm sure you know that. I'm sure you're experiencing that. While there will not, there may not be nickels coming out to you in the form of, here, build this, build this, build this, but there is that secondary benefit of Paso Robles has it going on. They've got a spaceport, they've got this land, they've got this vision. Look at this video, look at this, look at this thing. We can see these guys flying over the airport for a, for a new complex. Your name here kind of a thing. Um, that's where the value is gonna, gonna show up. And, that's, and then it's gonna be in, in, in the, the jobs to the Paso Robles, it's gonna be in the property tax and the, sale, the point of sale sales tax, things like that. It's going to pay out the back end uh, tenfold. Thank you. I, I hope I hope I answered those two questions. Good. Thank you. Appreciate that. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Great discussion. We'll open it to the public. Anybody in the room that'd like to speak, this is your opportunity. Please make your way to the lectern. Welcome. Dale Augustin, 945 Spring Street. I'm going to age myself a little bit. I lived in Lancaster when the population was less than 10,000. And uh, people traveled. I, I, I'm really impressed with Stewart's background. I don't know why he lives in Ridgecrest, though. <laughs> because, <laughs> but it's close to Mojave. I understand that. But these two gentlemen, John and Stewart, you need to keep them involved in this process you won't find anybody more qualified than the two of them, and especially since they're willing to work with Paul and uh, Bill 
uh, and the rest of the city uh, staff. Uh, this, I helped start the first wine festival, which brought tourism. We need diversity. This spaceport is that diversity, and I fully support it. I think that this will, it may grow our city more than you expected, but it will provide a valuable thing for our country. It'll help provide security for our country as well as for uh, providing uh, workforce jobs and other related industries at our airport or near the airport. Please, this is a better investment than the kiosks in the park or a bridge to help a guy develop a shopping center next to 46. Don't get turned off by the cost. Invest it. Thank you, sir. Welcome. Good evening. Larry Werner and Larry Werner Consulting. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Witt and Mr. Smith for the great presentation. Um, it kind of summed it all together after reading the, the staff report, which was pretty intense. Uh, it, was, it all makes sense, and I'm very excited about this. I'd also like to thank uh, Councilman Hammond and, and Mayor Martin for spearheading this process, and um, Mr. Britton for joining our airport commission. Thank you. And Mr. Sloan for all he's doing for our community to, to do economic development. I've been involved with economic development in the city of Paso Robles through the Chamber of Commerce for a long, long time. This is very exciting and it's fascinating to me. Um, I've always been interested in, in um, space. Um, when I was a kid, um, I used to build um, my own rockets and um, it probably wasn't the safest thing I've, I've done, um, but I didn't also wear a helmet when I rode my bike in those days. Um, and I was able to meet the local fire department because of my activities. <laughs> um, so um, this is, I think, an incredible opportunity for the city of Paso Robles and the region, and I'd like to look at it as a regional type um, basis um, because that's the support we're going to need and that it will benefit the region. Um, I, I'm representing a, a property owner that owns 60 acres on the south side of Dry Creek Road which is right adjacent to the airport and the question that he has is will this affect the safety zone boundaries that might affect his properties? That's my question. Thank you. Thank you. My first question is, Larry, are you wearing a helmet still? Now? <laughs> He's changed. <laughs> An avid biker in the community. Hi, my name is Greg Haas. I'm a senior district representative for Congressman Salud Carbajal and also a resident of Paso Robles 906 Carner Court. So I'm here in, well, I was here as a citizen capacity, but also have some role to clarify some things for you that have come up in this discussion. Uh, I wanted to highlight some some components. One is about the Chumash National Marine Sanctuary. Um, I, uh, while it was mentioned that it may be a hurdle to uh, cross uh, regarding this, I spoke to the director of the West Coast Region Office of National Marine Sanctuary while you guys were out for a moment there, and he does not see any avenue for that being a problem unless you plan on flying under a thousand feet which I didn't imagine, and <laughs> no. that you were permanently dropping something in the sanctuary. So if you dropped something and picked it up, he said that probably wouldn't be a problem. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't see that as a hurdle, but you, you'll want to consult with them, of course, as any of the federal agencies, including the Department of Defense regarding Whiskey 532. So yeah, and, and um, we would be glad to assist, uh, the Congressman's office would be glad to assist you with those conversations. The other is about funds, um, and we've talked about that, Mayor, uh, and council members, I believe, in a couple times. Um, there, there's funds, you know, coming available on infrastructure, and um, in fact, we're, the next point I want to point out is talking with REACH about making partnerships. Uh, part of one of the things REACH is working on with the county and the city of Morro Bay, and the county of Santa Barbara is discussing um, some waterfront uh, commercial space and offshore wind infrastructure development. This may tie into that. 
don't know if you're dropping something in the ocean, you're going to have to pick it up from the ocean. You're going to have to bring it in via the ocean. So the waterfront comp component may be a part of that. So I, anyways, I just wanted to mention those three things as, as you consider this, that those, those are not real hurdles, you know, uh, uh, insurmountable hurdles to, to cross. And, and uh, it looks like as a citizen, Greg, um, a great project and a great opportunity for our city. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the room who'd like to speak? Yes, ma'am. Welcome. Cynthia Petrovich, 381 Quarter Horse Lane, Pass Robles. Um, I've given this a lot of thought. This is a fabulous, fabulous presentation, and it's very interesting to see um, where we're going in our, in our town. Um, some of the questions that came up reverberate some of the things I've thought. Loss of control when we go to the federal level, you know, for our little local place here. Um, but I get to the point where, where I live is in the flight path of the airport currently. I've owned my home for 12 years, and in that amount of time, I've really noticed the increased air traffic. I do hear all the takeoffs. I do hear all the comings and goings in my air thing, air, air flight. I've watched the fire planes go up over my house, and it looks like they're 10 feet over my house when they take off. Um, I think that full disclosure here might be a good thing to know. I, I think I looked and it looks more like the flight path is north and west taking off up that way. I don't know what the return path is. Um, a little more openness about the noise level and knowing that we may start with four a week or four a month or however, but we know when success happens, now we're double and we're triple, and now we're exponentially more and more and more. When do we lose control over those numbers? Um, but it is it does sound like a very exciting opportunity and one that I would love to be able to support. But a little bit of information on that, that noise and stuff with my airspace. Thank you. Great, thank you. Is there anyone else in the room who'd like to speak? Welcome. How are you doing? My name is Greg Arenas, and I'm representing the Naval Postgraduate School. And uh, actually, I have a briefing with my admiral on Friday at 1300. So I'm going to beat up on Paul to get a copy of the slide deck. And uh, I'm going to present this to my boss and, and present it to her as a, well, we can't let Cal Poly get all of this. <laughs> Great. Good. So, um, no, and that's a joke, that's a joke, I'm sorry. But um, we've already really talked about it. We're in what we're calling Project 2052. What do we have to do at the Naval Postgraduate School to provide the Navy what we will be like in 2052? And as you and I have discussed as well, how does this tie into Paso Robles in the airport and the space uh, port? And so all of this, there's a lot of stuff that is going on behind the scenes. And I heard you guys talking earlier, yeah, what about this and what about that and so forth, and I just giggled. But there are a lot of things going on behind the scenes that will lead credibility to this. Um, no, we don't have a formal LOI, but that's what I'm gonna ask my boss for on Friday is that I think we need to do a formal LOI because we can't let Cal Poly get all this. <laughs> <laughs> Not education, bitch. Ah, I'd like the record to reflect that we were first. <laughs> <laughs> It was date stamped when it came in. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> and I'll argue we're Department of the Navy, so we're bigger. <laughs> you can yeah. be the first the to give us a check. California check. yields to the Department of the Navy. <laughs> the Air Force. <laughs> right. We love both the Air Force and the Navy. You can take that to the parking lot, though. So. Yeah. <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the room who'd like to speak? Hmm. I see no one rising. Anyone online who would like to speak? No, sir. Very good. We close public comment. Bring it back to our collective consciousness here for some discussion. I've got some comments to make, but I'm going to make them last. Anybody want to talk? Mr. Strong? Well, I'm going to talk, actually. I, I, I like the whole thing. I like the whole thing. One thing in the report, it, uh, on page three, it says, starts off by saying, visibility of Pastor Rolls is historically excellent. I wish it was a lot stronger. Back in the late 80s, early 90s, we had, uh, I believe it was Hanson International, who was at the time managing almost every major international airport in the world. 
And I had happened to work on an airport uh, advisory committee in Santa Clara County with this gentleman. And he had become the CEO, fortunately. So he knew me and agreed to come here and gratis became an advisor to our airport and our land use plan back then. And one of the things they noted and why they wanted to do it here is he said, were you aware, he said to me, that the Paso Robles Airport is the best all-weather airport in the continental United States? And that is supposedly a fact. Nobody else has the number of clear days in an airport, in a functioning airport, that we have. We're a very unique weather pattern here. And so I wish that was a stronger statement in that particular case. And I would say another thing about that, you talked about an extension of 1,200 feet possibly. And if you're talking about the runway that runs uh, southwest to northeast, then when that was built originally uh, by President Reagan's uh, administration, because we had Secretary of the Interior Clark, who was a rural resident of Paso Robles, on his cabinet, and the FAA, at no charge to us, no cost to us, built that runway to 727 standards. And it's only a 1,200-foot extension on that runway and the deepening of the base to make it 747 cable. So we are in a very good position at the airport in that particular instance. So we've got a lot of FAA interest and knowledge about our airport already, too. So I'm hoping we make use of that. Um, I would like to point out something else when we say about ask them and they will come. That's exactly what Texas did to California. They began their success in the tech industry by inviting California companies to move and to come to Texas and they would give them advantages. So I think we should learn the lessons of history and apply them in this particular case. And when it says, when you said, we need to get Caltrans to declare space as a mode of transportation. Believe me, in whatever capacity I have in transportation, I will be using it to affect that business, if I can in any way. Happy to work on that. And definitely, I favor us moving ahead. Thank, Thank you. you. Other comments? Yeah. Mr. Hammond? Well, I think, again, what we're going to be asking here is, what are we going to do from here on out with regard to funding? I think, I think... Mm -hmm sounds like the council's uh, energized to move forward. And I, I think, again, that we need to move cautiously. And, and I mean, I'm confident with testimony from Tartaglia and Mr. Witt that their proposal with funding is, is pretty accurate. We're not going to see anything like a, uh, an explosive in there somewhere. But the next phase is, you know, to get it moving. And, and I just heard testimony also from Greg that so the Cabo Hall, Congressman wants to try and help us, and I think that's a very, very important facet to this because, again, the infrastructure um, bills that are coming out right now on the federal side, this is basically a space transportation infrastructure. So I, I just don't see any reason why we shouldn't be able to have funding. That's the part that I'm really concerned about, though, is as we move forward, you know, we've got to be able to fund this and keep it rolling. I don't want it to stop, but we also need to work on the other side to keep the funding coming, too. So, again, that, that's pretty much my comment, Mr. Harris. Thank you. Others? Mr. Gregory? So, Fred, I'll argue with you about the airports. Mojave might have us beat on better weather. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I would agree with Councilman Hammond. I think it's really important that um, we have staff come back to us, but I like the attitude of Mr. Uh, Stu is we have a lot of people looking at us and considering what we're doing. And I really feel like we'll get financial partners wanting to join us rather quickly, I think. And I think that's some part of that conversation. So I think that um, a wonderful presentation, and I, I don't see a downside of this at all. I, I do want to pay attention to the noise factor that our one resident mentioned, but I think you can solve that with routes. I think it's really important to keep an open mind and keep this direction and energy we have going with a lot of good friends with Mr. Britton and Stu and um, Tartaglia, 
engineering? I think we have all the ingredients to make this successful. And I just think we need to open the door, go to the next step, and see what comes. And have the council or the staff present us some financial information. Others? Okay, before I make my comments, I would like to have an answer to the one question that was asked during public comment, and that is, will this affect the safety zones at the airport? Can anybody say that? Mr. Smith. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, it, it's my understanding, no. Uh, and I, I would like to address the, the Airport Commission's questions earlier with regards to the process of, of creating, establishing the, the procedures for on airport and the, and the opportunity to participate and to, to share in that experience. I, th I think you can see in this group tonight a commitment that nothing is done behind closed doors with regards to what we've been talking about. To get to this point tonight is, is we've, we are a success because we are here right now because of these weekly meetings we've been having and the, the, the open interaction between us, city manager, the economic development uh, uh, gentleman. Um, there will be opportunities for uh, the airport commission to participate, to, to review, to chime in. And I, I think that, that absent a spaceport committee, the airport committee, as you sit tonight, would be the, the most logical entity to represent the interests of the airport and to share those interests as we create the documents. And, and I, I don't want to, didn't want to ignore your questions, and I, I hope that this gives you some level of confidence that, that the goal here for everybody is to, is to cohabitate, again, uh, to not circumvent, to not trump, to cohabitate. We all don't really know what that looks like right yet. Um, and to Councilman Hammond's question about the noise, I, I think uh, we've seen some very impressive platforms or aircraft or whatever you want to call them. That at the end of the day, at the end of the night, they are they are jets. Uh, the, the, the one of the concepts that was shown in this document was a a, a horizontal platform with some sort of a separation, where then there was an ignition out over the ocean uh, beyond the sanctuary. By the way, um, and. Uh, uh, but again, that would be that would be out there. Uh, we don't we, that that's admittedly we don't know what the platform looks like tonight. Um, so I, I think we collectively we need we need to take that next step to to further define what we're all about. Hope I've given you some confidence, and I hope I've answered your questions. Hang on, just a sec, Mr. Christians. I just want to make one comment, not really a question. Uh, I just wanted to say one thing. I. I'm, I think it's a wonderful concept, and I think you guys are going to find ways to get the money with partnerships and what have you. And I think as a community, just one thing that we have to remember is bringing along the rest of the community is probably going to be one of our major tasks to do, right? And I think information is probably key because you can see some of the questions that get raised just by the effect of saying spaceport. Mm -hmm. Although I'm fully in favor of the concept and I love the idea, I think it's going to be fantastic. But just wanted to keep that in mind. So thank you. Thank you. Councilman Hammond. I was going to ask John a question, but maybe you can just nod. The navigation <laughs> easement that I'm sure you've worked on with our airport was put on there for a reason. Do you see it being expanded at all because of this new type of uh, transportation? No. I didn't think so. I just want to make sure we protected our airport many years ago with a navigation easement over it that basically keeps people from shutting us down, so to speak. So. Yeah, a little known fact, imagine Edwards Air Force Base to China Lake, every property, every property in East Kern has a navigation easement over it. Yeah. It's been going on for a while. Long yeah. time, yeah. Okay. Any further comments? Mr. Britton, anyone else? Councilwoman yes, Garcia. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to say that we have always been a strong community and we've always come together and we have all the experts here. And I wanted to talk about um, having the information on the website. I think we talked about that from the get go, that we're gonna have Paul's information on the website. We're gonna direct the community to ask questions, to see this whole preliminary on our, on our website. So when we get emails that we can send them to, to the plenary, to the report tonight so they can see what's going on. A lot of people are 
you know, viewing us and listening to us. But this report is also going to be online um, for them to see. And we we know we get all the questions, you know, noise, safety and things like that. And we're we have the same concerns. And so we um, wanted to get that from the get go. We wanted that information. So every time. You know, the mayor also does blogs and he posts uh, that event and every time he has a meeting. So everything and we're trying to be as open to the community. But yes, that is definitely one of our important uh, issues is to keep everybody informed and, and step by step of everything that's going on. So I, I just wanted to voice that again. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, for myself, uh, I don't, it'll come as no surprise that I support this. Uh, <laughs> I, so, somehow that has seeped out. <laughs> but in trying to step back from my initial excitement about this idea, because the initial excitement was spurred by the question in my mind of how the city of Pass Rebels could benefit from the philosophy of economic uh, development, regional economic development that is being supported so strongly not just in this county, but the counties surrounding us and around the state. Counties working together to regionally develop economically rather than city by city by city. So the question in my mind was, how does Pass Rebels do that? And a long story, if you can believe it, a longer story than you've heard tonight, made short, is that that is our Pass Rebels Airport for all the reasons you've heard tonight. Uh, this, is, this is our contribution. This is the way we capitalize on the philosophy of regional economic development. Some of my earliest conversations were with the REACH organization because they're the ones who over the last two, three, four years have spearheaded this philosophy of regional economic development. But quite honestly, at times have grappled with exactly what does that mean? I mean, they're, they're pretty words, but what does that mean? And I submit that a pastoral spaceport is the very definition of regional economic development because it will benefit not only pastorables, but Atascadero and the other cities in San Luis Obispo County and Monterey County and Santa Barbara County. And it will list the assistance of all the allies that organizations such as REACH, as REACH have worked to put together to make these things happen. We talk about funding sources. We talk about uh, political leverage. We talk about all of this. That's what they've been working to put together for four years. And these are the tools that are available to us right now to make this happen. Many, many successes have happened in the community of Pass Robles. I, I, I never tire of bragging about our city when I'm at meetings outside of the city or with, with individuals uh, that I've just met. And I, can, I could go on literally all night long, and usually do until somebody stops me. But in very macro terms, there are several basic, fundamental, significant transitionary moments in this city over the last 50 years. One is tourism. I've lived here since I was three years old, and I remember a day when if somebody said, you know, we could have tourism in Paso Robles, you got laughed out of the room. But the city of Paso Robles, its wineries, its hotels, its businesses, said, you know what? We see a community that's ripe for this. We see an area mm -hmm. of the state that's ripe for this, and we're going to invest in this, and we're going to make it happen, and they did. That was a transitional moment for the city of Paso Robles. Another transitional moment for the city of Paso Robles was in 1991 when the city council of that day updated the general plan for the first time in 20 years and had to wrestle with the questions of what is rural atmosphere, what is economic development, how do we balance growth versus quality of life, and came up with a plan that said, and its goal statement was, we will be the retail hub of the North County. There was a lot of laughter but look around you. That's exactly what's happened. That was a transitional moment for the city of Paso Robles. Another transitional moment for the city of Paso Robles is when we said, you know what? We got a water problem here. And over a decade, the city of Paso Robles and its allies worked together to put together a portfolio of water sources, including groundwater, river water, Nacimiento Lake water, that assures us that we will have water through build out in our general plan, something very few cities in the state of California can say. That was a transitional moment for the city of Paso Robles. I see Spaceport, if it becomes reality, and there are still a lot of questions to be asked, I see Spaceport as being a transitional moment in the city of Paso Robles because if we're successful, we're going to greatly diversify our economy. We're still gonna have the wonderful tourism, we're still gonna have the wonderful quality of life, 
but we're going to have a diverse economy that will be better able to survive the economic ups and downs of the markets as the days progress. We're going to have many more jobs of kinds that we've never seen before. We're going to have kids and grandkids that go to Cal Poly and when they graduate, they get to live closer to home because they don't have to move out of state to find a job. And these are th benefits that are going to accrue not just to the city of Paso Robles, but to all the cities and communities around us. So this is not a Paso Robles thing per se. This is regional economic development. Uh, I I've taken it upon myself to reach out to a lot of the people that have been suggested tonight regarding partnerships and potential funding. Uh, our governmental representatives at the state and federal level, the REACH organization, Paso Robles, uh, California Go Biz, the Chamber of Commerce. I've reached out to neighboring cities saying, this is a regional opportunity. Will you join us in this effort? It's the first issue I've ever been involved in where somebody didn't say, not interested. Once people get past the notion that, we're, that we could possibly be doing vertical launch with great fireballs of exploding gas to a horizontal launch, which is basically a jet takeoff and landing, and they see the potential for the attraction of economies and the, the growth of existing economies here in the city of Paso Robles, the light bulb goes on. And they're looking for ways to make this happen because the return on investment on that hefty price tag we see in front of us tonight, the return on that investment is 10 times, 100 times, 1,000 times over the years. And as far as funding sources, one thing that I witnessed when the city of Paso Robles said we're going to be the retail hub of the North County, all of a sudden, businesses and industries that we had never heard from before were calling us on the phone saying, we hear you're going to do this. How can we be involved? I fully believe that's what's going to happen here as we move forward. We've already seen it happen. The first time this council discussed this subject, just as an informational item, before the meeting started, Paul was getting phone calls from people who had seen the agenda posted around the country saying, what's going on in Pastor Robles? What's Facebook? When's that going to happen? That's going to happen. Those resources and those allies are going to come forward. I firmly believe that. I also firmly believe that in order for Pastor Robles to inspire these people to be our partners, we have to be the leaders. We have to say we're putting first skin in the game. We're not walking up to you with a tin cup going, can you give us some money? We're putting skin in the game to make this happen. And that's, that's going to help make it happen. When I was speaking with uh, John and Stu, when they were putting their report together, they said, you know, we kind of need a vision statement. We need a mission statement. What, how, what are we calling this? And I said, you know, here in Paso Robles, we've got a strong, strong pioneer tradition. This is, I've said it over and over again, this is a can-do community. You know, don't tell Paso Robles it can't do something because they'll do it just to prove you wrong. And I said, the mission statement for Paso Robles Spaceport is that the city of Paso Robles is pioneering the future of the commercial space industry. And we are working to reboot the relationship between the state of California and the aerospace business in this country. That's what we're doing here. And all the benefits that fall out from that are going to benefit us and all the people around us. So I am strongly in favor of moving ahead with the first phase as identified in the staff report and then keeping watch on the type of information and the type of questions that pop up and the type of answers we receive and using that information as guidance as we approach the second phase to see whether we're going there or not. And I think the stronger that we move forward, the more allies are going to come out of the, out of the woodwork, woodworks to stand with us. So, end of speech. I would entertain a motion. Steve, a uh, question on the motion. It says staff is looking for direction. I, so we'll go to phase please. two. I move we I, I make a motion that we move into phase two with the uh, complete comprehensive funding and everything that goes with it. Yeah, second for discussion. Certainly. Uh, motion by Councilman Gregory, second by Councilman Hammond. Discussion, Councilman Hammond. I would definitely re reiterate the uh, the funding part of it. I think that's I think we're all eager to move forward. Um, but we need to be careful with taxpayers' dollars, too, mm -hmm. so, um, and hopefully it won't be all of our taxpayers' dollars. That's what I'm hoping for. So I think if we can direct staff to start getting on the hunt for that as well. So. Councilman Strong. Yes, and I agree with the Councilman Hammond, but I also much more hopeful maybe than he, because we've got people in the room who can help us do that already. Yeah. Uh, there's grant opportunities out there if we take some preliminary steps, and they also take the preliminary steps necessary to get the federal money 
into the state and then down to us. And that's doable. And uh, I think we've got even more, more allies than, than just Congressman Carvajal. I think we've got Car Congressman Panetta that will be on board with us, too. And I believe very shortly I'm going to have a number of other congressmen from around the state who are going to join in that group because this word is spreading and it's spreading rapidly. And I fully agree with the motion. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other comments from council? Uh, Mr. Then. Mayor, this is Elizabeth Hall, your city attorney. Uh, yes, ma'am. If I could just clarify the, if I could clarify the motion, uh, so we don't actually have um, on the agenda tonight for you for the council to take an action, uh, but merely uh, to provide direction back to staff to um, have them come back with a budget proposal for the next phase of the spaceport, uh, and take any appropriate steps to implement um, the sort of consensus that they heard this evening. Right. Thank, thank you for that clarification. So we're giving staff direction. So I'll remove my motion and ask staff to go for it. <laughs> Just bring, does this, bring us some paperwork. Okay. Does, does a second go along with the go for it? Yes, yes it does. <laughs> okay, if there's no further discussion on the motion, roll call vote, please. Uh, Mr. Mayor, can I clarify yes, what Mr. the motion Lewis. actually is? Okay. <laughs> Go for it is pretty encompassing. <laughs> so uh, Elizabeth says no motion. How about it's a motion uh, to direct staff to return to right. council right. at the earliest date possible with a budget proposal uh, and appropriation request for the next phase of the FAA spaceport license application process. Yep. That's perfect. That's what I'm reading. That's what I meant. <laughs> you see, that's why she's here. And the second agrees to. Okay. That's when he, we when have he a reworded motion oh, thanks sorry. to the city attorney. <laughs> We have a second to that motion. If there's no further discussion, roll call vote, please. <laughs> Council Member Gregory. Aye. Council Member mm -hmm. Hammond. Aye. Council Member Garcia. Aye. Council Member Strong. Aye. Mayor Martin. Aye. Motion passes 5-0. Thank you to everyone on the council, everyone on the two commissions. Uh, I think it's a big night for Paso Robles. Okay, that's the only thing on our agenda tonight. Uh, any closing comments from anyone in the room before we get going here? Way on the end. Yes, sir. This is Eric, Chairman for the Airport Commission. It's probably not the right time, but I want to congratulate and thank Roger Oxborough for 38 years, and he's going to be missed big time. Thank you. Round of applause. You're not gone yet, though. Yeah, you're not. <laughs> don't, don't wander away, Roger. Yeah. <laughs> Upcoming events, Development Review, Review Committee will be meeting Monday, April the 4th at 3.30 p.m. Our next City Council regular meeting is Tuesday, April 5th at 6.30 p.m. And if there's no further business in front of the Council, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. So so moved. Motion by Councilman Hammond, second by Councilman Strong. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? We are adjourned. And as always, thank you all for your hard work. Okay.